One of the things that was said in the press conference by the governor's office was that, well, you could use spring break to make up. Stacy and Kareen, you might want to understand that we will figure that out with our associations, with our community, all of those things. We have days printed on our calendar that we use as makeup, and there's a whole system that we know well about how that works. So I think we have everybody here for the first item. Jean? Good morning, Jean. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I, I think there's, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so our first item today is a appropriation for uh, economic recovery. And this is to support the work of the Maryland Technology Council, which has a program that they are going to walk through uh, in detail, and we'll have a chance to have some dialogue and have questions. Good morning, uh, Director Nagam. You may want to put off, turn off your video icon until the next item. Um, and uh, so we have joining us from the Maryland Technology Council, Marty Rosendale, Tom Thompson, Bill Enright, um, and this is an appropriation that over the last month or so, we've been just handling all of these things at full council. They haven't necessarily had committee sessions to work through anything about them, but uh, I felt like this was a good one for us to just, you know, take a few minutes to talk through and understand. And uh, Tina Benjamin is joining us. Tina is the chair of the mission group on the executive branch side that is um, operating in similar sector here, life sciences, tech. Um, so she's gonna share some comments about what the work is that they are uh, proceeding through in that group. And um, hopefully we will wrap this up by 945, I think, and then we'll proceed into the housing issues, HOC production fund and um, so forth. So Gene, I'll, I'll start it with you to um, kick us off and then we'll proceed into the dialogue. And I know Marty has a presentation uh, to use. Uh, he'll share his screen for that. It sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Um, I, I don't have a lot to say since you've already done a lot of the introductions. Um, the committee should make a recommendation today on the $250,000 special appropriation. I'll note that I believe that executive staff has some suggestions on how to do that. Um, and we can do that when we get there, but I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Rosendale and go through his presentation for the committee. Okay, before we do that, I certainly invite my colleagues, if you'd like to, you know, any broader comments you want to make about the various initiatives we have with economic recovery, you could do that now, or we could do that as we proceed in the dialogue. And I think we can try to keep this one free flowing. Never quite know how to handle the speaking requests, but it seems to be manageable for the committee to kind of just do it in real time and just speak if you want to speak and we'll see how that goes. So, okay, Marty. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time this morning and the opportunity to speak with you. I'm Marty Rosendale. I'm the CEO of the Maryland Tech Council. Um, just a brief little, little background about myself to give you some um, perspective about where I'm coming from. I, I became the CEO of the Maryland Tech Council about 20 months ago. Uh, prior to that, I'm a biotechnology CEO myself. I've been the CEO five times. Two of those companies have been Maryland-based, Montgomery County-based companies. Um, one of them was a California company. Actually, two of them were, were California companies. Um, but when I had the opportunity to to locate companies where I chose to locate them, Montgomery County, Maryland was was where I chose because it made the most sense of, of anywhere else in the country. So I do have a brief slide deck that I'd like to share. It, uh, right now it says the um, host has disabled screen sharing. So, can we, Gene, do you have the ability to adjust that or do we need to go to Michelle Parsons? Ms. Parsons will be able to take care of that. Um, I cannot, sorry. Oh, it just gave me the, it just gave me the permission. All right, great. Perfect. All right, so 
put together a couple of slides. First, I, I know most of you, or all of you, know know what the Tech Council is, but just uh, quickly, I wanted to show you a couple of things. Today, our membership is 400, 458 members. The organization began 36 years ago as the Montgomery County High Tech Council. Um, I, I put this density map of our membership up here because I wanted you to see that there are three clear clusters of technology and life science companies in, in the state. Those clusters are Frederick County, Baltimore, Baltimore County, and Montgomery County. And as you can see here, Montgomery County, again, no surprise to you, remains the most dense cluster of technology and life science companies in the state. Uh, the Tech Council, fundamentally our mission, is to help our members succeed. We do that through advocacy. We have educational programs, one of which uh, I'll be describing to you this morning. Uh, we also work with our, our members in workforce development. We have a significant cost savings program and, uh, and we do a lot of connecting and uh, supporting of collaboration. So what brings us here, again, it's, it's no surprise, you're all aware of the problems that we've been facing over the last few months. Um, you know, this has been a black swan event like we've never seen before. Um, we certainly have had these kinds of events in the past, whether it was 9-11, the dot-com bubble bursting, the recession of 2008. Um, but this one has been very unique. And I, I think to some extent they're all unique when they hit, but this one has been uh, particularly challenging. That said, there are, are a number of similarities that, that we're seeing with respect to this event as with others. So as, as we're recovering from the, the economic downturn, we're seeing in, investors telling us that they're supporting their current portfolio companies first, and then they're looking at new investments. They're being much more cautious. They're looking at, at uh, smaller smaller tranched investments and, and other things. And these are all things that, that we've seen in the past. So when we entered into this pandemic, I began talking to our members about what they were facing, what they were seeing. And I heard a number of things, and I'm sure you've talked to your constituents and you've probably heard all the same things. Coming into this, if you were a company that was in, in process or considering raising capital, um, you got hit hard right off the bat because investors stopped investing almost immediately when the pandemic hit. Um, they've begun investing again, but as I said, slowly and cautiously. And so if you needed to raise capital initially, you got hit hard um, in, right from the beginning. If you were a commercial business, not a development business, then you may have seen your pipeline begin to dry up. Either your salespeople couldn't get out and make sales calls because the, the the customers that you typically call on, their businesses were closed and they weren't available, or for for other reasons, you, could, you couldn't get out to make those sales calls, so you saw your pipeline drying up, or your supply chain uh, faced challenges. Uh, if you were Im importing products or materials from other parts of the world in particular. So, so we began to see a, a lot of challenges right off the bat. Now, some of these companies told us, I don't have a problem today, but when I, when I look at my, my pipeline or my supply chain, I can tell you I'm going to have a big problem three weeks from now, four weeks from now, um, because I, I see that, that pipeline drying up. So, so we have companies in a number of different stages at, at the moment. We also have many companies in Montgomery County that pivoted in response to the pandemic to support, the, to support that response, whether it was uh, technology companies that came together. Uh, I don't know if you if you saw the relief wizard that was produced by a number of technology companies that that came together and cooperated to produce an app that companies could use to identify which stimulus packages they qualified for, or whether it was three um, D printing companies that that collaborated to produce personal protective equipment, or life science companies that came together for to produce diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics. A number of companies pivoted. Now, there was a significant amount of federal assistance, federal, state, and local assistance to do that. Um, interestingly enough, we're, we're starting to see now that as those companies are, are considering pivoting back to what they were originally doing, there's, there's no state stimulus or federal stimulus for that pivot back. So that we're starting to see some, some issues around that. We also had some companies that just simply closed their doors. I was talking to a, a company on Thursday, uh, a life science company that 
that they made the decision that they could they could close their doors for a period of time. They actually leased their laboratory space out <clears throat> to other companies that were that were uh, working in response to COVID nineteen. Now they're thinking, you know, how, how do how do we restart? How do we come back in, in, in the business and get back to what we were doing? So so we're seeing a number of a number of issues, a number of challenges um, that our companies are facing, and and in response to that, we went out and I I and others began thinking, well, what can we do? What resources do we have? So we identified a number of executives that have been active volunteers with our organization that have successfully led our guided companies through past events like this. And these executives are prepared to step up and help these companies through this. Now, one of those assets that I mentioned when, when we were thinking about what can we do, five years ago, with the assistance of Montgomery County, we launched a program called the, the Venture Mentoring Service. That program has been extraordinarily successful. We licensed a platform from MIT. It's a mentoring program like, like no others that I'm aware of in this region, not, not just the state, but, but the, the entire region. They, the platform was developed and continues to be supported by MIT. Um, we currently have 130 mentors that have gone through the training. These are current executives, past executives, um, people that want to give back to the community, that want to support the, the industries that they've come from. And as a result of this program, we've been able to focus on helping companies prepare for the capital markets, uh, helping companies grow their businesses, deal with the challenges that they face. And those companies over the course of that five years have raised in, in excess of $55 million, 47 million of that in Montgomery County. So the, so the plan here is to leverage the value that we've developed in this VMS program, but it, it's in a different in a different fashion. I don't want to, I don't want you to be confused and think that this is an, just an offshoot of the VMS program. It's not because the pro, the VMS program we've been able to onboard about ten companies per year into that program. So we have about 50 companies at this point that are a part, are, are an active part of the VMS program. The business continuity task force that we're proposing has to be much more aggressive. We have to act much faster. We have to be able to onboard 100 companies in the next 12 months if we, if we truly want to be effective to support the need out there. Um, it's going to en encompass a highly specific skill set. You know, these are leaders that have that have led companies through these kinds of challenges in the past that understand what it's going to be like to deal with with investors over the next six months and how investors are going to be behaving what it means to be financially resilient um, how to prepare if if we were to have a second surge of of COVID 19 how to be how to be ready for that and and so it's a much different approach that relies on the asset that we've managed to develop because of the VMS program. Now, the business continuity task force, first of all, this is something that is very personal to CEOs. It's actually personal to the mentors and the CEOs and the executives that are volunteering their time because we want, they want to see our peers survive and thrive. It just it just kills us anytime we see a company that fails and and, and that failure's not because the technology failed or for, or for some other some other reason, and and so from that perspective it's very personal, but it's also very personal for the CEO that's experiencing the challenge. I can tell you that CEOs generally aren't accustomed to talking about these kinds of challenges in public. It's not something that they want to talk about. It's not something that they're comfortable with. So we need to create safe opportunities. We need, we need this funding so that we can bring on board some, some executive assistance to, for the outreach that can talk to these CEOs about the challenges that they face. So, so, so some of this funding will be spent in that direct personal approach to get those CEOs to understand that we have a resource that can help them. Some of it will be used to create safe meeting opportunities um, one of the, one of the people that I was talking to about this program uh, just a couple of weeks ago is is 
um, Ola Sage, and we were talking about uh, a peer group environment. Can we, should we produce peer groups within, you know, these organizations that are having these challenges? And, and how would we go about doing that? Because again, it has to be a safe environment. They have to be comfortable talking about these challenges. So, so the plan here is to bring on board the, the staffing necessary for, for that personal outreach so that we can talk to those CEOs, understand their challenges, bring them into the program and introduce them to the task force members. Part of it is for the meetings and things that need to be uh, built around this to support the CEOs. But the process itself, um, by the way, we have begun this program. We, there, there was just, we couldn't wait to get it started. We needed to get moving. We've got companies that have been applying to the program already. The way the process works, a company identifies that this is something that could benefit them. We assign one of our task force members to that company. There's a discovery call where they assess the situation, identify the challenges, help prioritize those challenges and then begin the mentoring process that, that may involve a referral to another mentor that might have more specific expertise, a referral to another solution provider. Um, there's a lot of pieces to what this might look like. And as I mentioned, um, we also plan uh, with Ola Sage's help to establish peer groups to support these companies going forward. So there's, there's a lot to be done. There are a lot of companies that could use this kind of support and assistance um, going forward. Uh, I'm happy to share this slide deck with you. I've included my brief bio. Um, you, you heard from Councilman Reamer that um, I have with me today, Tom Thompson and Bill Enright, who are volunteer members of the task force and also mentors with the VMS committee. Um, their bios are in here as well. I'm happy to uh, send a copy of this slide deck to all of you if you'd like to see it. I, I would also tell you that on our website at mdtechcouncil.com, right on the front page are all of our COVID-19 resources. The, bio, the Business Continuity Task Force is one of those resources. There's a badge you can click on that will take you to a brief description and all of the bi bios of all of the initial task force members <clears throat> um, that we have in the program. So, so as I mentioned, Tom Thompson and Bill Enright um, have joined me to provide their perspective as, as members and volunteers. And so if I may, um, I would like to introduce uh, Tom. Please. So Tom, if you could introduce yourself and um, you give us some of your perspective. So we'll Everyone. stop the screen sharing, I think, and shift back to- Happy to. Very good, there we go. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Tom. It's a great pleasure to see everybody. Welcome back to the County Council. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a delightful opportunity to be here and to have a chance to speak with you as well about this uh, important uh, question. Um, to echo Marty, um, you know, quite obviously, we are in a unusual situation today. Um, a black swan event is certainly one way to describe it. And uh, it's changed virtually everything, at least in terms of how businesses can look at what they're doing, how to move forward and so forth. Uh, many of the businesses that I've had the chance to speak to um, um, are dealing with you know, the basics, uh, looking at cash flow, looking at to see if their business model fits to where it should be today to deal with this new environment, to looking at you know, what is the timeline they have to consider in terms of their business planning. And for many of them, you know, they're looking, trying to look, they have to look short term to deal with issues around, you know, how to manage, how to manage COVID, how to manage cash flow, and looking at what that means to staffing, which is a huge, huge issue. And, uh, you know, trying to determine how to keep employees or to furlough them or whatever. And certainly not last but not least, customers and how you maintain that customer base, how you stay in touch with people. How do you keep those relationships warm and you keep your brand intact and so forth? Um, the, the need that Marty mentioned before is something that I think all of us have seen and we've experienced in work that we do, not only with, with uh, the tech council, and, and, um, uh, but through our own businesses as well. 
Uh, many of the companies that I work with are right in the middle of this and, um, you know, are really trying to manage these, these issues. And it's not just tech and life science, quite obviously, but it's the mom and pops out there as well who are, you know, struggling as well to try to figure out how best to be able to manage this totally unusual and really difficult situation that we're facing today. Um, I do believe that the the program is really, as I've seen in, in the work that I've been doing with it so far, um, has been able to provide at least the, the the CEOs I have worked with so far in the in the task force with a way in which to get that um, not just second opinion and but it's 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 sharing experiences uh, for those of us who have been through these types of situations in the past and really being able to help and problem solve not to tell people how to make decisions but helping them to make them themselves and to do and to make uh, to make decisions that are going to have an impact in terms of them being able to stay in business keep their employees and so forth and with that i will stop there thank you tom sure. appreciate that all right why don't we um uh, hans can, can i ask Bill, just to make a oh, yeah, comments. Bill. Great. He wasn't on my screen. There you go. Bill. How are you? How's everybody? Good. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would echo some of the, the, the comments that have been, been that have been made. I think it's really important uh, as a, a CEO to be able to have sounding boards. Uh, you, you, you can't go to your board. You, you want to show that you've got uh, things under control. You can't go to your management team because you, you want to make sure that you're showing the leadership and you're out in front of this. And so it, it's important to be able to have a safe yeah. environment that you can uh, learn from and gain experiences. And I think the, the members of the task force uh, that we have all have been through this uh, and, and uh, have experiences that they can lend and I think, uh, as Marty said, you know, initially, um, all are willing to give their time and help give back to make sure that we have um, a, a solid uh, community here that uh, continues to grow and develop. I mean, I've been in the, the biotech space here in Montgomery County for for over 30 years now. Um, I'm currently CEO of a company called Vaxitech that is actually in the UK. We just opened up a US sub here in Montgomery County, um, but uh, we were involved in, in the um, COVID-19 vaccine development. So we've we've out licensed our vaccine to AstraZeneca. So the, the one you see on the news as far as the, the warp drive or whatever, uh, the uh, Oxford, uh, that's, uh, that's our technology that's moving forward. So. Hopefully, really? we're going to be part of the solution to this as well. But Wait, so um, think, you, your company developed a technology that the Oxford Institute is using for their uh, – they're in a very advanced stage with the vaccine at this point. So so we were a spin-out of Oxford, and, um, and it's the, the, all of the products that we have are based on that underlying platform technology. And so we actually were collaborating uh, with our scientific founders at Oxford uh, to de and and we're uh, and co-developed the vaccine, and uh, and then we were moving forward in in Europe and the U.S. while they were focused on on the U.K. and so it quickly became evident that you know getting a big pharma player involved because of the the need for uh, not not millions of doses but billions of doses billions, of yeah. vaccines um, you know is going to take more than a forty person biotech or a, or a university setting to make that happen. So um, getting the right people involved. We could go on for a long time about that whole topic. That is super interesting. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it is only symbolically relevant. The fact that you are here, you know, you're bringing the caliber of CEO to the table. What I love about this program is it's leveraging the private sector. You know, we're, we're passing a lot of appropriations now to try to get kind of a lifeline of, of dollars to businesses that have been severely impacted. This one is trying to get a lifeline of expertise and network strength and network access. And I think that's uh, also you know, an essential ingredient of our strategy. I'd like to go to Tina because Tina uh, is, you know, we, we had a great conversation about this and she thought it would dovetail with some of the work that the executive branch is undertaking. 
Sure, thank you, Councilman Reamer. I appreciate it and I'm happy to be here this morning. So as part of the county's overall um, recovery strategy, there is a specific group looking at economic revitalization and recovery. And that is broken down into five subgroups, one of which is life sciences and advanced technology. And I really have the pleasure of chairing this group. It is a very fast moving group, um, bringing forth a lot of ideas. I think it's important while Bill touched on this and, it, and it's great, we actually have um, a bright spot in our economy that is really at the heart of them, the pandemic, that being the vaccine. And we have companies out in the community, life sciences companies that are accumulating a lot of capital, that are growing, that are hiring. And by the way, when they are putting out um, requests for uh, new jobs, they are getting bombarded. If that gives you any indication of the state of the economy. Um, it has been pointed out though on numerous occasions that all tech companies in Montgomery County are not the same. And so while we have some that, again, that are dealing with the vaccine that are going gangbusters, there are a lot, as Marty talked about, that are really struggling like other companies in the community. Specifically what we've heard, and Marty alluded to this, is assistance with like virtual business development. Both how do you engage in those activities and market research, things like that, um, grants writing, there is money flowing out of the federal government, but um, there seems to be a lack of expertise on the part of some of the smaller companies. How do I go after these grants? Um, and then just some things related to what businesses in Montgomery County are all faced with, which, you know, a little bit of childcare, the rent relief, you know, struggling to get PPE supplies, things like that. So it seems to be a, a tale of two communities in a way. And the life sciences advanced technology group is really looking at both angles. How does Montgomery County take advantage of this unique set of assets that we have in the biotech arena? But then also how do we really assist those that are involved in that arena that are struggling? So I really believe that the program that is being proposed is going to be of great assistance. It's not the kind of expertise that um, folks in the county government have to provide this kind of assistance. So it, I think it'll be a great partnership with them. Thank you, Tina. All right, well, I'd like to open the floor to my colleagues. And, uh... I have a question here. Uh, if I, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I saw in the packet, it said 65, 80 businesses over the year. Could you talk about your selection, how how people get to you and where that mix is going to be and how, you know, how that's going to, to run or how you envision it running, I guess, based on past experience? Sure. Uh, so, so a number of ways, there are a number of ways that we will get to these businesses. We, we have managed to pivot to this virtual world pretty effectively. Uh, one of the things that we do are a, a lot of networking events, and, and we, we try to keep them you know, relatively small, 20, 25 people. Um, and, and, we, and now we, we've switched to Zoom like this, and, and we do what I've, what I've begun calling moderated networking events that allow us to talk to CEOs um, and help, help identify the challenges that they're facing and then make, help them make connections. Through those efforts, we're, I, we, are, we have been identifying companies. The first, the first companies that have applied for this, this support have come through those kinds of efforts. Um, we also intend, be, because you know, coming back to the fact that this is a very personal thing for, for CEOs to deal with these kinds of challenges, and CEOs often feel very alone. Um, we want to we want to hire, bring on board um, staff that can facilitate this outreach. Just get on the phone and start calling these companies and having conversations. What what are you facing? What kinds of challenges are you seeing? And, and how can we help? What kind of resources, what kind of connections, what can, what can we do to help you through this? So there's also gonna be a direct personal outreach component to this. It, so that's, some, that's, of this some of this money you envision using for that, high, that position? Yes, okay. absolutely. And it, because what we've seen with the, with the VMS program is it requires that personal outreach. You know, the, the advertising, the digital promotion, 
that's all great and it's important to get that kind of recognition but it's that personal outreach it's that safe opportunity to have a conversation that that really drives this well i wonder if, thank you I, that's helpful and if anyone else wants to chime in but tina i was thinking you know of the overlay between because i don't know how many i saw the little bubble chart at the beginning you know we, we're thankfully we have a robust you know life science and, and tech industry here um, so it's probably a large list of companies. I wonder if there's a way to target that outreach. Again, if we're cold calling based on people who've applied for PPP, I mean, not PPP, but uh, uh, FEG, I'm sorry, I got my program, federal county program. You know, I, I don't know if that would be fruitful, but it might be a good thing to, uh, and, and just a suggestion of, we have limited resources, limited time, if you know that there might be a business that is in need, many are probably in need, but maybe that's a way, some place to start. Just, a, just a thought. Mm -hmm. Councilman, that's a great idea. Uh, we, we do collaborate on a regular basis, not only with the county, but with the, the, the chambers and others. And, and so, and we will continue, of course. Yeah. And I, and that's all I have. I think it's a great program. Somehow I am not listed as a co-sponsor. I'm the only one really? not listed. But uh, I, I thought we had asked to be a co -sponsor. I thought you were on. I don't, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> yeah, so so I, we'll, we'll, we'll make that clear. But I'll, 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 I'll second your, uh, your request for amendment there if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You were, you were definitely on. You were definitely on. Uh, I, I'll you. just chime in uh, quickly. Really good questions by uh, my colleague, Councilmember Jawando. I, I have been serving on the Economic Revitalization group and have participated in a number of the life sciences and technology uh, working group and uh, echo all of the comments that Ms. Benjamin uh, made earlier. And I think, you know, really the, you know, not all created equally has been a, a key uh, theme that I've heard uh, loud and clear as well. And I think that's why this is so important. Not only does it leverage our key assets in the community and, and expertise and talent, which is, you know, our greatest uh, natural resources is, is talent in Montgomery County. You know, we don't have, uh, you know, it doesn't come from the ground. It comes from above the ground uh, in terms of what we have. And that's what this really speaks to. But uh, it also uh, speaks to knowing what we don't know in county government. And I think this you know, will help us, as Ms. Benjamin mentioned, we just don't have this level of expertise, nor frankly, do we need to have it because we can do things like this. And, and, and so I think, uh, you know, this is a fairly modest uh, way to, to leverage the tech council and uh, just as importantly, uh, folks like Mr. Enright, who who really know what they're talking about, know a lot more than, uh, you know, forgotten this morning more than I have ever known about uh, technology. Um, and, and, you know, the last thing I'll, I'll say, what excites me here, I, you know, I've said a lot that I think that we are positioned better than anywhere on earth to whether the current storm that we're in, uh, the black swan moment, so to speak, is uh, was uh, raised earlier, but to be better positioned than just about anybody else, if not anybody else on earth, uh, you know, to really, you know, soar out of this, uh, you know, and, and, and these challenges. I mean, there's mounting evidence that grows by the day that, uh, you know, the, the, the solution to the problem, whether it be vaccine uh, or related, are gonna come from Montgomery County and the infusion of capital that should be available, the recognition of the importance of the life sciences. Uh, and then uh, in addition to that, I think there's tremendous opportunity, you know, medium and long-term for technology, because if, any, if, if we've learned anything in this moment, it's, it's not just the importance of uh, the health sciences and, 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 and biohealth solutions like vaccines, it's the, it's the reliance on technology in order to do modern commerce and the solutions that we will need through technology, not just to uh, prevent and to address the next public health emergency, but to be able to address the next any emergency, because, you know, ultimately the, the need to work from home, the need to, the need to work remotely, the need to have technological solutions to the problems we haven't even contemplated yet are gonna come from the hard technology sector. And uh, we need to really be focused on that sector in a significant way. And I don't think the county government has the core competency on its own to do that. But with this uh, partnership, we could be you know, positioned to, to understand what the needs are. And you know, the last thing, you know, one of the 
biggest challenges that, that we have had, and I hope this moment helps us fix it, and I hope this uh, appropriation is part of the solution to the problem, but we have not quite reached the, the full potential to be as good as the sum of our parts in Montgomery County economically. You know, we have the best assets on earth, and each of those assets does really well, but somehow we have not figured out a way to take those ingredients and make the best possible dish. And I'm hoping, and I think we've gotten better, and you know, desperation during this crisis has forced us to eliminate some of these silos and to work better together, to figure out ways on the government side in particular to get to yes, as opposed to, uh, you know, deciding why uh, we, we need to get to no. Uh, but I'm hoping that this is part of the solution to figure out how we knock down some of those silos and figure out how we leverage all these assets and, and to reach the full potential of the talent and of the strategic assets that we have in Montgomery County. I, I think this is one piece of that. I think there's more we need to do, but I think this is a, a, a piece uh, of that. And I'm, I'm very bullish on it and, and excited about it and, and look forward to seeing what we can do with it. Perfect. Okay. Um, good. Well, I think that, uh, We'll take care of the item. Um, keep us posted, please. Uh, I know you will track the uh, the businesses that you're working with. Um, I mean, we'd like to see a report. I think you know when it's all done, talking about the companies that came in and what kind of support they were provided. Uh, and I'm I'm excited to be able to uh, help forge this partnership between the Tech Council and the county government. You've always been kind of in the orbit and. Marty, you said that the county helped create the mentorship strategy some years ago. Um, can you share a little bit how, how you'll coordinate with MCEDC uh, as our chartered economic development entity? Uh, so so we, we talk and communicate with them uh, on a regular basis. I mean, they're, they're, they're so important to, to what we do, and, and I believe we're important to what they do with, with respect to technology and life science companies. And, and so we have uh, we've developed very good relationships with them. We meet with them on a regular basis. Uh, we provide them with a quarterly report about activities and, and what's happening with our with our membership, and the Tech Council, and and so there's uh, just a, a lot of communication back and forth between us. Great. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think I sounds like we'll have this as a committee recommendation without objection. All right. Mr. Reamer, yes. Um, I think there are a couple items just to touch on before the oh, okay. recommendation. So um, first, it's a fiscal 20 appropriation. Um, we've got eight days until fiscal 20 ends. I believe when we talk that fiscal 21 made the most sense. Is that? Yes, uh, I, I think that's right. But I want to ask uh, Tina about that. You know, initially I said yes, fiscal 21, because it makes sense to help finance process things. Uh, but what about the um, savings plan we're going to be entering into for fiscal 21? Uh, wouldn't it make sense to just put this on the books in 20? But I'll 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 follow your guidance here, Tina. You know, but share us, share with us what you think. So, and this I'm I can't recall right now. The source of funds is. It's currently the general fund reserves. That was the second item I was going to touch on after this. Thanks, Gene. All right. We, we can change that source to of funds. We want we to change the can... source of funds right. to uh, the CARES Act. Okay. Well, if we do that, then I would suggest that we make it an FY21. If we're not using FY20 money and we're using CARES, that it would just make our lives administratively easier to do FY21. And since Good we're reason. that close, is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Jane, so we'll make it FY21, CARES Act source. Any other items specifically? Um, I believe OMB would prefer if this went to the Office of the County Executive um, for them to administer the contract as a non-competitive grant to Maryland Tech Council. So that would also be amended in terms of the, the location of where this funding is going. Okay. Um, I'll uh, let see, Tina shaking her head up and yeah. down, but I'll. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. All right. All right. I believe that takes care of everything. So again, we'll, we'll change the source of funding, the fiscal year, and the location, but it'll be a non-competitive grant to Maryland Tech Council. If, if that's okay with the committee, that will be the recommendation that goes to the full council. Very All right. good. As amended. All right. Without All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. That Thank takes you, care everybody. Of this item.
Thank, thank you. you very much. Look forward Thanks to very much. We appreciate the time. Yep. Thank you. Th work. Thank you, everybody. And just one quick offer before we drop off. Um, if, if you ever want me to come back and give you an update on what's happening in the in the tech and life sciences communities of Montgomery County, I'm happy to do so. Thank so, you. I, I think we you. should. I, you know, when we when we have more time at the committee, uh, right now we're on a very, we're like on a 50% schedule for our committee time because of sure. the need to sure. just reduce the staff presence in the building. If we can create more time, maybe in September, we could do like a whole update on how the company, uh, how the county is part of the COVID-19 response in the life science sector. I think that would be super interesting. Um, and, and, you know, generally more around tech transfer. You know, we, we've got a whole broad economic development strategy conversation that we would normally have been in the midst of right now. That was the plan, um, you know, but COVID has just thrown everything to the side and we're, we're trying to scramble to re, um, you know, re-engage those issues. So tech transfer, for example, which is closely uh, related to the life science and technology sectors in the county, uh, is an, a topic that I certainly intend to return this committee to. And, uh, you know, we were looking to devise stra new strategies and programs. Uh, we've already devised new strategies and programs over the course of the past, you know, eight or nine months. Um, we'll get an update on those and, and hopefully break some new ground as well. So we'd love to have you as part of that conversation as well. As yeah, Mike Tyson uh, said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> or, <laughs> for regrouping. But I, I think happened. that would be great. Thank you. That happened for sure. <laughs> All right, good. All right, well, All right. thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Take care. Okay. Well-timed. It's 945, more or less. Um, and we are going to shift gears now to housing. Uh, we are going to take up the... Um, really uh, innovative proposal from the Housing Opportunities Commission. Um, I, I estimate that'll take us, you know, a good hour and a half or so. We have as much time as we need for it. Um, and then we asked the executive branch to give us an update on their fund, the Opportunity Fund. And so before we break, we'll spend the last, you know, half an hour or so, maybe less, just getting an update on that. There's no action we're going to take on the opportunity fund today uh, but we're just trying to get a better sense of it as we proceed into a number of other conversations about housing uh, over the next couple weeks uh, this item uh, i'm hoping we'll have an action well we should have an action today recommending to the full council um, what uh, you know what how we want to support this initiative uh, and you know, what, what, what are the, the goals and objectives and as you know as a predic uh, predicate to the conversation, we kind of fenced off uh, a, a substantial amount of funding in the HIF for uh, housing and the leaving us the ability to devise some new programs and some new strategies. Um, but we also felt like we needed to resolve those in a timely manner. Um, so I, I'm really pleased to be here today. We have joining us, we have uh, three terrific uh, teammates from HOC, Stacy Spann, Executive Director, Kareen Brown. I, are you the CFO, K Kareen? I, you're, you're uh, the... No, it's much longer than that. Chief Investment and Real Estate Officer. Chief Investment and Real Estate Officer, thank you. Yes. And Zachary Marks, uh, Development. What, uh, sorry, Zachary, tell us your title. I'm it. Director of Development. Director of Development, great. Um, and uh, HOC, and the county have been working on a number of incredibly innovative housing strategies, often involving master plans where we zone specific parcels for very, I think, aggressive, visionary, affordable housing strategies. And often those have been in partnership with private sector leadership. So we're also joined today by McLean Quinn from EYA. Uh, EYA has been really there from the beginning of the kind of quantum leap that we've taken in this county with HOC and the private sector working together to meet affordable housing goals and Shane Paulin from the Duffy companies as well, also partnering with HOC. So these are two companies that are building this model in partnership with HOC that we're gonna be hearing about today. 
uh, Shane, your you know your company's in the ground now with a big project in White Oak, and McLean, you just you know you have a building open in, in Chevy Chase that is one of the it, it's uh, won the the Kemp Award for one of the best uh, developments in the whole country with affordable housing. So uh, Linda McMillan is going to walk us through, I, I suppose, an, in, an introduction. Uh, there's a lot, I think there's a, a lot of relevant background information to share. Uh, HOC has prepared an extensive presentation. There are some options in there and we will get to the options and uh, make a recommendation. And then, uh, uh, you know that's that's our that's our business for today. But um, I, you know, to my colleagues, we've been working on housing for quite a while. Uh, I, I had initially planned a press event that uh, I was hoping you and the rest of the council and everyone we would be together. I think the date we had set was March 24th, um, and uh, we were going to be rolling out a number of significant initiatives. Uh, this being a signature element, but also a new strategy to support construction around WMATA property, which has lagged terribly in the county, and uh, a financing strategy to support acquisition, preservation uh, in the Purple Line corridor, where you know we have an urgent need to to be very assertive now uh, around housing uh, to better support our nonprofits that develop housing or acquire housing with high shares of affordable. Um, so we had all these elements and they were, we were gonna roll them out together uh, March 24th. So that did not happen for obvious reasons. And um, what, we, what we've done is pulled it apart and we're gonna just bring it through one piece at a time. So that's, that's why we're here today. This is the, the first element of a very broad, I think really, um, noteworthy housing strategy that we'll be contemplating with the potential to create thousands and thousands of units. Uh, our HOC strategy is using the county's uh, chartered federal affordable housing partner. Uh, you know, HOC is our first uh, partner when it comes to significant uh, housing development and uh, has, a, has an incredible track record. So, uh, you know, when we think about housing, we, we should always think about HOC as a key partner in our strategy. And I think today's presentation shows why. Um, they, they have tools and resources and expertise that are really unparalleled. And uh, when we wanna get to scale, you know, they have a way to do that. So the presentation they're gonna give us today is taking years of, of work and, take, and providing a, a path to take it to scale. Um, and it is one that is uh, fundamentally about achieving the, the public good, the public goals of new production of affordable housing that is for residents who are very low income, 50% median or below, uh, as well as some that is more market, uh, 60, not market, MPDU, 65% uh, percent AMI. Um, and then a lot that is market. And we have shortages in all of those areas. We need housing in all of those levels of income, very low income, moderate income market. And, and this is a strategy to help provide all of those in a way that over the long term, it seeks to be financially self-sustaining. Uh, and that's, that's a really a key element of it is, you know, you can't get housing that is below what the market requires unless you are able to subsidize it. And this is providing a path to do that, that doesn't, after it's built, necessarily require county subsidy because it's using a model like the social housing model that we had a terrific briefing about a year ago uh, or so, uh, where the, 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 built, the buildings internally, subsidi you know, the, the numbers all work out internally in the building uh, because of the way that the rents stack. Um, so we'll, we'll learn more about that today, but, um, I am, I'm really excited to be here. We've been working on this presentation. Uh, well, HOC has been working on this presentation. We've been working on this on this idea for for months now, and uh, feel like it's it's really ready for prime time. So, Linda, if you could please, um, you know, help frame this conversation. Points we want to make, and then we'll we'll turn it to HOC, and they will walk us through. And then 
the we have EYA and and uh, Duffy companies are here today uh, as a resource. Um, so questions that we may want to ask, uh, they're available here to answer. Um, so, Linda. Yes. So I think you've done a good job, but I'll just say, um, in opening, the the council and the Fed committee have been working very hard. Uh, to find ways to both increase new housing and to preserve housing. And so during budget, which as you've noted, um, took an unusual turn this year, you all had started to have discussions about both. So at today's session, this first discussion on the HOC housing production fund is really focused on the new housing part. And of course, at your last meeting, you had an update on the planning department's housing needs assessment, which much like the COG numbers and the Urban Institute numbers, uh, continues to show a need for all kinds of housing, but in particular, affordable housing. So today's focus from HOC is on a housing production fund. Um, the DHCA Opportunity Fund, which you were able to have an initial discussion of in February, but then not able to return to was discussed uh, more in the preservation fund mode, but again, looking for new creative ways to leverage county money to create financing mechanisms for preservation. And then I would also say that the council agreed to put $6.8 million in a designated reserve that would either be used to be leveraged or would be appropriated into the HIF. And so uh, there is, there is funding in there both for a production discussion that you're having today, but also to return to a preservation fund discussion with that money as well. And so as I uh, understand how the committee would proceed, you would have this very full discussion today of the HOC production fund. Um, they have a presentation for you. I expect that um, the committee will be able to make uh, some recommendations today, but it is also an opportunity for the executive branch to fully hear the production fund outline. And so we may have some details that we need to be able to respond to after this meeting. Uh, and so, uh, and then at later meetings, after you get the update today from DHCA, my understanding is that the chair would like to return to have a discussion of the possibilities for leveraging financing for preservation as well. Correct. And yes. We so, will, that that we will that that meeting we're scheduling for three weeks yes. or so from now. Right. I just wanted to make sure everybody knows like both things are on the table. Right. Uh, but today is the production fund and I think really the best way to get started is to let the Housing Opportunities Commission give you their presentation. Excellent. Well Stacy Spann, welcome and thank you. Sure. Thank you for uh, for having me. Um, Good morning, council members. Uh, so uh, there's not a lot I can add to a to a preamble uh, that uh, Ms. McMillan and, and Chair Reamer didn't uh, already note. And so I won't belabor it, uh, except to say that uh, we're, we're clearly in the middle of uh, an unprecedented uh, global um, public health crisis. And, and yet, uh, Tearing away at that is also uh, this this uh, what's what's clearly been recognized as uh, what will uh, mushroom into a continued uh, housing crisis, and um, and that'll devolve into uh, an even more serious affordable housing crisis than than we were facing pre-pandemic, uh, and and so um, the cog numbers uh, are are well noted. Um, everybody's. Um, uh, been been clear to sort of sign off on those, um, but dare I say they might be exacerbated, and that's the you know that's the crux of it. And uh, uh, at at HOC, you know we're we're doing three simple things. You know we're trying to get people housed, keep them housed, and help families and individuals reach their fullest potential. And and I think this is part and parcel um, that broader mission uh, objective. And, um, and so with that, I'm just going to let the team uh, walk walk you all through it. I uh, want to quickly thank um, EY and, and Duffy, uh, who've been partners um, and continue to be partners in, in what are not easy transactions um, and, uh, and yield from that uh, incredible communities uh, that are part of this, this, this county. So um, uh, Kareen and Zach, I'll let you take it away. 
that. So I'm going to lead off, and I'll jump in later on. Sounds good. Okay. Um, well, thank you to the committee members, um, and um, wanted to first say uh, thank you to Council Member Reamer and to uh, Ms. McMillan. Um, this has been many, many months of working together, and we were pleased to have lent our, you know, our technical expertise to, you know, what has uh, been a, um, you know, an important part. The council has been very focused on production as an important component to solving the housing crisis in the county, and um, so we were pleased to be able to lend some of our expertise and work together and come up with uh, what we think is a, um, you know, is a highly executable plan. So um, we'll walk through the presentation. Um, you know, the desire isn't to spend a ton of time in there um, unless you want to. So um, if there are places you'd like to dig in on or digress, um, you know, certainly yeah, just I, cut us my off. My colleagues, I think as we go through, I think we can ask questions as we go through. And then to the extent that something is better explained by a later slide, Zachary, just tell us, but okay. I think we can work our way through this uh, and, and, you know, ask questions as we go. Terrific. Um, so just starting out on um, with the executive summary on slide two, I mean, um, it, can you, uh, can you, I'm sorry, are you able to share your screen or should we open up our, uh, either way, I'm happy to share my screen if that's easier. Why don't you do that? I think okay. That, that way the, that way everyone watching will also be seeing the same thing. Sure. One second. Can everybody see that? Yes. Great. Um, so, you know, I think um, one of the, I think right off, right off the top, uh, council member Reamer noted that, that this was really, this is really, um, while there are some, you know, some neat things going on here, this is really using um, well understood tools and plugging them into, um, you know, a, plugging it into a model that HOC has already been using. And so what we think is so important about this is that in, you know, in, in this fiscal year when there are, um, you know, obviously lots of important priorities, um, housing has to continue to be a priority, but we certainly want to spend money where it can be uh, immediately deployed toward, toward the solution. And so, um, so what we've come up with here is really, this is a presentation, but it's really a memorialization of the work that, you know, really, um, you know, everybody pictured here has, has done uh, together. Um, and so, um, you know, this is a highly efficient fund. And what that uh, means is it does a lot of things with a dollar. Um, you know, we get a revolving fund that, um, that produces a significant number of MPDUs, um, and it does so, uh, it, does so uh, in a way that allows HOC's pipeline um, to hit the, to, to really hit the ground on time. Um, it's self-sufficient because you know without the HPF, um, our typical uh, resource, like many affordable housing practitioners, would be the HIF, and so this allows us to actually avoid going to the HIF for uh, funds on these projects. It also allows us to leave other important resources to the other uh, affordable housing practitioners, projects in the county, um, like LIHTC equity, volume cap, things of that nature, because these projects would not need to access those either. Um, Maybe, let me pause you there for, sure. for a second, Zach, just so we can uh, dwell on that for a minute. So HOC regularly is provided financing from the HIF, right. uh, but you, you receive that financing on a case-by-case, project-by-project basis. What this would do is create a uh, just say, we know we're going to be working with you and we actually want to take it to scale. So let's get out of the uh, project by project mode and let's get to scale mode by securing funding that HOC can then uh, self-administer in a very efficient, uh, timely manner in a very predictable way so that you can be very aggressive as with your whole program. Is that a a good way of characterizing it yeah precisely um and then you know kind of a knock-on benefit is that you know without the hpf what we would typically do on these um on these communities is we would we would typically turn the affordable component into a tax credit deal and and have to go get tax credits have to um you know typically access the hif and so what we are able to do the hpf actually allows us to go forward with these transactions without having need to having the 
to need to stop for those resources, leaves those resources for other projects. It also helps with time because, um, you know, to get LIHTC equity, you have to go to the state, you have to go through their process. Uh, and so in this case, we now control our own destiny, which is also, um, you know, really, um, really helpful to getting these projects going and on the ground. So you, you would normally have to have a complex set or stack of different revenue sources in order to proceed with the project. This allows you to have one simple framework and you right. can proceed very efficiently. Right. Yep. And as we would have agreed on the template here for the kind of affordability we're, pro we're providing, and HOC being, you know, the county's housing authority, um, you know, that, that balances that that uh, assurance that the template that we're describing here is the template that's going to, you know, actually hit the ground. Um, it's ready to execute. Uh, one of the things we'll show throughout the slides is that, you know, this is coming in midstream in terms of um, what HOC has been when doing what has been doing around mixed income housing. And so we can, you know, we can, as we, as I said from the top, we can use this money from go. We have ready to go projects that are extremely attractive and, um, and can close in this fiscal year. And so we can see that money go to work right away, which is, you know, critical when we're choosing which dollars to put where during these, you know, difficult times. And it's also scalable. So, you know, we can, um, this is, uh, we can add to the HPF in the future with future bond issuances. Um, every additional dollar is additional unit. So there's not a, there's not sort of diminishing returns. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we have uh, a pipeline already that exceeds, as we'll talk about, you know, here on the next slide, if my thing will work, um, actually two slides down, I'll just skip through. You know, we already have a pipeline that's larger than what this 50 million would fund. And so that's, um, that's good because it means we're gonna definitely use this money. Um, it also means that if, if, the, if the council ultimately likes what it's seen here, whether today or in the future, it can come back to this and say, hey, do more of that. Um, and it's a really simple um, execution to do so. Okay, wait, let's let's pause here for a second. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, let me just reiterate the history. We've been working on this. Uh, you've been before the council in meetings. I know Councilmember Friedson has participated in many of those meetings without, obviously with, without me in the room, uh, helping to think this through. I, I know you're talking with Councilmember Jawando. Um, what you have on this slide here is what, can be done with a $50 million fund. Um, so you estimate that for a $50 million levy, uh, you can, let's talk, talk about the numbers, because I, I think it's helpful to think about this in chunks of 50 million, and then we can also talk about what funding the county has to put on the table in order to create that. So. Sure. Yeah. And so to be clear, so uh, this slide is really talking about HOC's existing pipeline, which, as you might expect, um, most of that pipeline is uh, in here in the first five years as the further out you get, the, you know, the less, um, you, you know, you're not pursuing deals to close in eight, eight years. It's just not the nature of the business. But but we do have enough projects that we know are multi-phase that they're already filling the second five years. And when we talk about what this um, fund can do, we, we typically talk about it in terms of 20 years because that's that's um, th that will be the life of the bonds that initially finance this fund. And so uh, essentially over the first 10 years um, with uh, a $50 million fund, um, that would uh, finance 1,750 of the units within this existing pipeline within the first 10 years. You could expect that you'd get another 1,750 um, approximately in the in the second decade of the 20-year um, bond life, and so that's uh, a way that we've tried to frame it to make it um, consistent with what the you know consistent with the bond instrument that's funding this. But that is based on an assumption that the fund is repaying the county interest as well. Is that right? It's not. Uh, this this right here is actually more around um, the two things so one this is this is not assuming a reinvestment of the project interest which you know we'll get into in a little bit of detail uh further down okay. uh this is just saying the the first couple of revolutions of the 50 million you know going out um 
you know, will um, we have deals ready to use those when that money gets paid back in four, four, four-ish years? Um, we have deals that we know will be timed uh, for that return and ready to use those, and it will use all of that, you know, again, use the 50 up, and that will get us, so just purely based on, like, the timing of the deployment of that 50, assuming about a four-year um, revolution, we'd get that 1750. Um, so if we reinvested, um, if we invested, if reinvested the project interest, we could do additional deals, which is sort of one of the other key points uh, on the first slide, which is that uh, ultimately this is scalable. So the more money that we have available, um, the more projects that the commission will feel comfortable pursuing. They, you know, the commission tries to be responsible about not extending itself too far and aligning what we're pursuing with our resources. And this would be a substantial increase in our resources and would allow us to uh, theoretically grow that pipeline beyond what it is today. The pipeline is what it is today based on the resources that we have uh, today. So just to quickly double back to three and we'll, we'll get rolling, um, is that um, this is all about meeting the COG goals. Um, the, um, you know, we pulled this, this is from the 2018 presentation, we pulled the numbers for 2019 and we got, we did much better in 2019 from a permit perspective, but we still fell short by about 275 units. And obviously this is all pre-COVID. Um, and we want, again, we want to emphasize that the county would be investing in an ongoing, um, as, you, as you mentioned, Councilman Reamer, it's an ongoing uh, model. Uh, starting in 2016 with EYA on the Lindley, um, you know, high quality transit oriented, um, mixed income development. And, you know, each year we have had a new start. And as you can see, these are all transit oriented, uh, highly amenitized, very attractive and mixed income. And, and so the general idea would be uh, to try to do more than one a year potentially. And as you can see on the next slide, and there's a little, I made a little error here. This, this project's actually, I copied it over and didn't put the actual number in. This is actually 463 units here. Um, and as you can see, the projects are getting starting to get progressively um, larger, uh, which is what we want. Um, and again, we've got 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So that you all are, would be buying into a model that uh, is already underway, and that's why we're able to deploy this money um, out of the gate. But Could I come in and ask a question here? So, uh, Zach, thank you for the presentation. So if you're, uh, if I'm understanding this right, you've, you have these many of these projects in the pipeline this would help you accelerate the projects but what would you do if you didn't get the money you would just do them slower could you just speak to that part yeah which is uh it's a, absolutely the crucial question so it does sort of three things um so on each one of these independent uh, of the of the hbf of the production fund hsc would do what it always does with these which is we have to go find financing for each deal um standalone on its own and, you know, fortunately, the commission um, has been good at ultimately getting there. But, A, um, you know, you can have, uh, you can find yourself in the middle of a crisis, and then you, um, and then perhaps some of that funding is harder to find. Uh, fortunately, we haven't found that uh, yet, but, you know, it's still very uncertain times. So there's that uncertainty factor. It definitely slows the transactions down because, as we mentioned, just to go get my tech equity from the state, um, you're adding many months um, from that state process. Um, so it's it's the certainty. It's also um, it's also accelerating the speed at which we can get to the closing. Um, and then the other thing is, again, the commission is making making decisions about the current pipeline based on the current resources that it has available. So if all of a sudden it has access to more resources, uh, it's possible they look at that and say, okay, well, we now have um, you know, a dedicated source of funding for these sorts of transactions. And maybe those other transactions that aren't currently in our pipeline that we kind of declined to move forward on um, because we were being responsible with our resources, we may now pull some of those in. And that's where you get this 5445 may go up then because we're willing to do a few more transactions that are out there. We don't do everything by any means. We don't do, you know, we're not doing every single transaction that we, uh, we have in our own portfolio or that, um, you know, that potential partners bring to us. Yeah, so, and so, Zach, so, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just, I want to uh, make just uh, two points. 
um, which Zach didn't really focus on, on he mentioned the, the tax credits, um, but a, a key element of the tax credit is volume cap. And um, HOC receives 38 million a year, which can only, which um, is available for both funding both single family and multifamily transactions. So that in and of itself will absolutely slow down these transactions if we had to use the tax credit as um, an execution. Um, and the second point, um, although this is being um, billed as, a, as an HOC fund, I think it's an opportunity for um, nonprofits uh, and, and private developers to also collaborate with HOC to expand the production um, in that this, this um, equity that's that would be available during the construction period, it's, it's certain, it's um, lower cost and will enable um, those nonprofits and private developers to work with HOC to, um, to even increase these numbers that, that Zach is showing here. These are just the HOC pipeline numbers. I think there's an opportunity to do more as um, uh, the execution is, is a little bit more certain. And when we get uh, further on in the presentation, the exit strategy is even more certain by this collaboration with HSC. So I think those are two uh, important points that, that we should highlight here as well. I appreciate that. And I'm assuming in later slides, you'll talk about the the 20%, 30, 10% affordability. I have some questions there, but I can wait if you're right. if you're getting there later. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So yep. I'll wait. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'll just, I'll make two quick notes on this slide and then it's, it's, it's right back to Ms. Brown. Um, so I would just uh, so I would note that these next two deals are part of why um, our private partners are are here with us today. Um, uh, this is West Side at Shady Grove, um, which is just right next to the Shady Grove Metro, and this is a you know a proving out what Kareen just outlined. Uh, this was um, and this was before even the HPF existed. So we think this will actually uh, augment um, this sort of a this sort of a circumstance where. Um, you know, our, uh, our ability to do difficult transactions has, um, and to be good partners has, uh, has attracted um, private partners to, uh, in, in some circumstances where it makes sense, come work with us. And so this is a transaction that EYA and Mizuto have done most of the hard work on, frankly, and uh, came to HSC to, um, uh, to, to make sure that we make it happen, putting transit-oriented development on the ground. And so that's this will be the second transaction that EYA and HSC work together on, uh, first for um, Bazudo and HSC. And then with Hillendale Gateway, this is the first um, transaction that uh, the Duffy companies and HSC are working together on. Uh, and so part of why we're able to do all this heavy lifting is frankly because we have, um, you know, we have capable partners uh, like Duffy and, and, um, and EYA and Bazudo. So. Okay. Um, and again, thanks for, for having us um, present this to you. Uh, I think it's an incredible opportunity to do something a little bit differently uh, in terms of producing housing in the county. Um, the strategy that we've been discussing um, assumes that we would um, issue taxable bonds, H that will be HOC issued bonds to fund um, the housing production fund. And the, the fund would provide uh, equity during the construction period. And so what that means is, um, in addition to uh, financing, construction loan financing that will be provided by a commercial bank, the, the fund would provide that 25% um, uh, or so of equity that would complete the capital stack for the construction period. And so, um, so, so it would be lower cost than if the developer HOC or the developer would go to the marketplace to find that source of um, equity to complete uh, the, the construction financing. And so the funds would be um, outstanding for the duration of the construction. And um, uh, for purposes of this analysis, we've assumed a 5% interest rate. Um, all those details are to be determined, but for, for now we're assuming that. And uh, assuming, for, Kareen, let me step in. So you're assuming a 5% interest rate repaid to the county and that we'll, we'll get to that later, but yeah. it, that's it, just an, something to flag. Okay. Sure. So it's, it's and, and it's um, because, and, and the program works in this environment because as you know, um, interest rates are substantially lower than, um, than where they've been historically. And so it's, it's important to take advantage of this opportunity and the taxable financing 
um, works and allows private developers um, to participate because there are there are unique um, rules associated with tax exempt financing and housing. Uh, and so taxable, without going into all those details on this, you, you, you need to, um, the taxable financing is what really works to fund this program. And again, there'll be HOC issued bonds of okay. faith. So I, mean, I just want to, I just want to jump in real quick. Council yeah. member Jawando noted, asked the question about whether or not this um, kind of supercharges and then allows us to fast forward it. And so mm -hmm. um, the answer of course was yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's more yes and, um, you know, we've used this before. This is what yeah. allowed us to get our initial um, uh, real estate strategy uh, to actually work really well. We, we hit a low interest rate environment and, you know, and determined that it made a lot of sense um, to, uh, to push through as much as possible right. um, uh, through that low interest rate window, which is, which is unfortunately not um, typically what happens uh, with right. housing authorities. Right. And so by, by creating this fund now, um, and especially fully funding it, um, you're able to secure this financing that then is able to revolve, as Zach described um, earlier. So so the funds would remain outstanding during the construction and, and through the uh, lease up and stabilization period. And then it gets taken out um, by HSC's issuance of um, essential function bonds or governmental bonds um, with HSC as the owner of the of the transaction ensuring the affordability uh, remains in place and into the future um, okay, and let, so, me, let me and, uh, Karine, let me just yeah. reiterate here so the sure. blue money symbolizes this production funds use of funding it is then repaid to the production fund at that mm -hmm. line where it says HOC bond issuance correct by that time the loan from this construction fund has been repaid and the building has new financing that you have other means to yes. support. So yes. we're this the purpose of this fund is to fund the construction phase mm -hmm. and allow the fastest, most efficient, most at scale solution. So you can get these buildings up as fast as possible and then you refinance them for the long term at that line where the HOC bond issuance comes in correct play. correct correct okay and because hsc is expected to be uh, the owner um, at the end we're able to issue governmental bonds uh, achieve a high uh, the highest loan to value um, yield in terms of loan proceeds and we're able to take out the um the construction financing almost in its entirety and if um and and you know continue the permanent financing um, and the funds from the HPF get paid back and um, are then able to be reused for the next uh, construction financing. Great. Please continue. Um, and I touched on this a little bit. Um, it's We're expecting the loans to be outstanding, the loan from the HPF to be outstanding for about uh, four years or so. Uh, for purposes of our analysis, we've assumed a 5% um, uh, interest rate. Uh, as, the, as we finalize the program, different decisions can be made, but for now the analysis assumes that. Um, and okay. we're not expecting uh, for, in, in, in the assumptions that we've um, run here, uh, we're not uh, assuming that there will be additional uh, HIF funding for these transactions, however, uh, because we 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 assumed 50% uh, of AMI and MPDU levels uh, for the transactions uh, that we're that we've um, we've discussed, if the county wanted deeper affordability, there's an opportunity uh, to write rents down even further, um, you know, by with funding from uh, traditional HIF or even from our commission funding. But for now, we're assuming the 30% affordability, which would have um, at least 20% of the units at 50% of the area median income and a portion at uh, MPDU levels. Okay, so 30% of the building, the assumption is 30% set aside, mm -hmm. affordable, and then 20% of the building is 50% AMI or below. Yes. 10% of the building is MPDU level, but that could be bought down further through other okay. programs of the county or other financial arrangements in the structure. Okay. Yeah, if I, if I could chime in here, this is where I, I 
probably a good point to ask my question. So uh, is that, I know this process that you were have done is something you had, have already kind of been doing. This would just be supercharging it to use Director Spann's uh, word. Is this the typical level of affordability in your current buildings with the current structure? So this is the typical. I think the yes, but I, I, yeah, I so this know. this is like the, this is the so like like a lot of the things that HOC does. This is kind of the this is the base structure that really most affordable finance yields, even tax credit deals. Mm -hmm. They sort of they yield like this shell of sixty percent AMI, and then it's all about layering other stuff on top of it yeah. to achieve other aims. Um, and so what we're not saying here is that we can't do any of that other layering. Um, we're not saying that at all. We're just saying that we can. Um, we don't. We don't have to slow down uh, if our goal here is is production and getting some, you know, some good quality MPDU and, and even below MPDU units on the ground. That said, our commission constantly pushes us to be thinking about how to how to leverage opportunities for deeper yeah. affordability, subsidization, and so forth. And so, they. Um, they will, on every one of these transactions, continue to push us to say, well, what else can you do here? So this is really just the base model, and, and mm -hmm. our point is that without any HIF, uh, without mm -hmm. any other assumed subsidy, we're already starting from a, a strong position. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and I guess, you know, what I'm trying to explore a little bit is, you know, at the beginning we were talking about, which is obviously very appealing, you know, that this, one of the advantages of this is that you can move faster, but it's also lower cost. Uh, and, and so to me, when I hear that, I'm like, all right, so there'll be, there automatically will be deeper affordability than within the normal transaction. Oh. So I'm just trying to understand that. It is, it, it actually is deeper affordability than the normal transaction when you compare us to, to nonprofits or anybody else. And, and generally you're going to get a greater level of affordability across a, a, a mixed income property. What we don't do is hundred percent low income. Right, right, of course. So, but, I, yeah. but there's a reason. I mean, it's not because we don't like low income. It's because uh, there has to be some 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 um, financial viability and sustainability to it uh, in order to to keep that that property uh, at a high level and reduce uh, additional subsidy need from from other sources. And so, it sounds like you, you, you're pushing the direction of where our commissioners are and they I mean they, they are all the time and, and rightfully are as am I um, how can we get more uh, deeper affordability and more numbers of deeper affordability yeah and and I and when I said as the normal transaction I meant the normal HOC transaction obviously compared to yourself if, if we if we're gonna if it's going to be lower cost and we're supercharging it and we're putting in some money in this revolving fund, I think it would be, you know, I would be interested in, in stating from the beginning, not like, hey, maybe we can find it later, but that there'd be a higher goal from the beginning. But, you know, I, and I, again, I, realizing you have a mixed income model, which, of course, I understand the reasons for. But even within that, uh, that's what I'm trying to explore, because if, it, yeah. if this makes it cheaper already, then can we build that in on the front end some way? That, and, and, you know, we can talk more about that, but that, that's where I'm that's where I'm trying to go with this. Yeah, it'll require some additional um, subsidy. I mean, obviously, we have some uh, assumptions built into this because we never know exactly what the market's going to do. So we have, we, you know, we build in a bit of cushion to make sure uh, the transaction is, is defensible and we can actually get it done uh, sure. um, as we as we move forward in time. Um, but my expectation would be that we would have um, uh, a greater level of affordability uh, at, at at deeper levels. Uh, anyway, and so we're, we're not going to run away from it. And, and, but what I will say, you know, when we get to numbers that I think are un, unachievable, I'm not. I don't. I'm not going to promise you something that that I know we can't sustain. Because the, the at issue also is sustainability. Can we sustain it? Does it make sense? Um, uh, and and how does it impair uh, or challenge the the financing structure? Let's keep. Uh, Thank you. We, we're not done with this conversation, but let's keep working through the presentation. And so um, here we're showing um, that with an initial uh, $15 million issuance uh, in the first year, uh, we would assume that the debt service payment that the county would, would commit to 
uh, from the HIF would be 2.8 million, and thereafter it would be 3.4 million based on current market assumptions. Um, and as you can see from here, uh, the first 50 million will be will be loaned in um, 2021, and um, four years later it would be repaid and recycled into the next uh, two transactions, and so on and so forth. Um, and this after, is, Kirin, I, just to state yes. the obvious, after 20 years, it's totally paid off, but after the 20, fund continues. Right. Uh, yeah, after after 20 years, the bonds are fully paid off. And so um, we, we we like to describe this for for, for ease of understanding um, as similar to, to the current, one of the current CIP funds, um, the MPD property acquisition fund, where the county issued bonds um, um, decades ago, I think, uh, funded uh, the revolving fund for the for HSC. The bonds were paid off and the funds remain available to HSC and um, is used for, um, for various things, including MPDU acquisitions. And um, the funds are used and they're repaid and, um, and revolve. And so this is a similar concept. Um, after 20 years, this is a, this is a fund that would exist uh, into the perfect liquidity because as it's used and um, the buildings are placed in service the, and, and the loans paid off, they're available for use in, in new projects. And so um, the county's uh, commitment would be for an annual appropriation, in this case, in a $50 million fund of $3.4 million annually. Okay, Reen, can I just, um, uh, Hans, this is Mary Beck. I have a clarifying question. Sure. Sure. Um, I mean, I was also going to turn to you, Mary Beck, when we kind of got through the presentation. That's fine. But, you you um, can do that if you want. Uh, why don't we? Yeah, I'll come back to you, Mary Beck. I, okay. I, I, sure. Absolutely promise. Yeah. Um, and um, on, on the next slide, so if not, uh, and we're estimating, um, which is an important point, leveraging of the county funds of twenty-five to one based on. Um, the, the present value calculation of um, the annual amounts and the um, use of the fund over the 20 years. Okay, let's look at this slide here. So, talk to us about phase two. Uh, hmm. So, um, the point of this slide is just speaking to the scalability piece. Right. So, if if the council moves forward with the 50 million, this is phase one only. So this is the appropriations, and these are the these are the transactions. These are the first transactions that occur under the production fund. And so the point of this slide, though, is to show that that if the council at some point, um, you know, either now or in the, you know, or prior to really uh, FY 23 decides, hey, this is this is this seems like a good idea and we want to we want to add to this we just want to let you know that we stand ready to put that that sort of second chunk um to work so again just yeah. emphasizing this be, is a scalable model what would be the advantage of doing the first chunk in 21 and the first chunk in 22 of uh, the second chunk in 22 50 and 50 what would be the advantage of going to 22 you, you, you sort of get at that with your comment about the interest rate environment. Yeah, I think I think that's that's really a key point. Um, uh, and even if even if the funds um, were to were to sit and and be invested, I think it would be um, a, a good decision. But you know that's something that can be discussed uh, later on. But at least locking in the funds today and having them available, and um, and possibly looking at what transactions could even be um, moved up sooner um, would be an advantage of making those funds available. Zach, I don't know if you want to add anything to that point. Yeah, no, I agree. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep going. Um, and so uh, on slide nine, um, we're basically showing here, so with the, with the annual um, uh, appropriation from the HIF, and the interest, the estimated interest that will be paid, that will be paid um, as, a as the loans are made to the transactions, we're assuming um, 2.5 million of interest being uh, being paid back. And again, we're we're we know that we have transactions that will be funded immediately in in FY21, and so 
um, because of the way these transactions are, are structured, capitalized interest would be part of the development budget. So it's not, it's not a situation where if there is money available, the interest would be paid. The transactions would be underwritten so that the interest is funded in the development budget and be available to dole out um, as interest payments are due. And so um, the 2.5 million would be would be available, would, can be invested into the HIF. And so based on, on the differential between the, um, the interest cost that would be pledged from the HIF and the interest paid back, the net cost um, would be uh, 900,000. Um, okay. I, I need to underscore here, however, that the commitment or the pledge from the HIF would need to be the full amount that would pay the annual debt service. Right, that's an important distinction. So yes. the, the, the annual appropriation from the HIF, again, was 3.4 million, but it was mm -hmm. 2. Point, is it 2.8 the first year? 2.8 in the first year. Mm -hmm. 2.8 in the first year, but if the council uh, wants to structure this in a way that the HIF is repaid, at a 5% interest rate, then as your slide shows, the the FY21 total impact, although the appropriation would still be 2.8, mm -hmm. there would be 900,000 that would be, or. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, it, in, in FY21, it would be a little bit higher than the 900,000, but starting in FY22, it starting would be the full amount would be paid, so it would be 900,000 starting in FY22. What, what's the amount that's repaid in 21? It's like 2.8. It's the, uh, yeah, so it's the 2.8 minus the 1.562 gives you this. So, so um, you know, I think we have we have a we we should decide today how much we want to levy in what years, and then how we want to think about the interest repayment. What what would happen? What would the fund be able to do if we did not require? interest repayment and we simply said the county would like to ensure that you you know we'll provide the annual appropriation but we want we don't want you to repay interest we want you to reinvest it and continue to expand what would you be able to do under those circumstances uh so, so that's the next slide yeah Kiri. yeah so in the next slide um uh the big distinction here um on slide 10 um shows uh, the amount that we'd be able to relend with a reinvestment in the in, in the um, in the fund. So uh, in FY21, we would loan fifty million dollars. Four years later, um, based on the reinvestment in the funds, we would be able to lend sixty million instead of fifty. So there's there's a ten million dollar increase to the fund, and it increases um, annually, resulting um, you know over the twenty years of three hundred and seventy seven. A million of uh, loans being made versus 250 under the first scenario and a, a much higher leveraging of those funds. So, units, what does that translate in terms of into units? Um, I think we had it on, to, yeah, yeah. I think we had it, of course, I put it on the first slide. Let's see. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, so it's this footnote here, number two. Oh. Um, so if the interest were paid back instead of the uh, thirty-five hundred, we would get forty-three seventy-five. Okay. Um, so you know it's a it's a fairly significant. It's about a fifty percent mm -hmm. increase in the units and the dollars. But but let's be clear. So I want to I want to um, footnote uh, both what I know will be our commissioners' desires. Um, as I said, mine and, and uh, Commissioner uh, Councilmember Jawando pointed it out in terms of a, a deeper level of affordability. This is net of that. This is what our our base model, with some um, pretty um, easy assumptions to to uh, account for, and and I say easy because we we modeled those. We know what that looks like uh, in in the lived environment, and so um, it gives us either additional units at uh, the, the, the current assumptions or um, additional capital with which to buy down uh, units at um, a, a greater level. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to note that. I'm glad, uh, Mr. Spann, that you noted that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer that if we do this, we should reinvest the, the funding. I don't really understand why we wouldn't. And I think to Councilmember Jawando's point, uh, if, if – the idea that we would not reinvest the money where we could leverage 
the dollars to get the greatest extent of affordability and units are two big goals here. We, we need more units to solve this housing crisis and we need greater levels of affordability to address this uh, housing crisis. This plan does both and we'd like to do more of both. And, you know, it, it's to me, it, it, the, the other way to do it would be to subsidize it in a standard format, as was noted earlier, through the HIF. But it would be better uh, to have more funds available that are leveraged to do uh, through this fund. And the ultimate benefit to our commitment to housing production and housing affordability is significantly greater. So, you know, I, I just want to, you know, I, we, we've had lots of conversations uh, about this uh, question. I spoke extensively with HOC uh, on this, and I want to make very clear that I think that the best thing to do here would be to, to reinvest the, the funds. It, it, to me, it's the equivalent of if, if for those who personally invest funding, if you have a dividend reinvestment program, it's the easiest, fastest way to make money without even really realizing it, where you slowly are reinvesting your dividends back into the underlying stocks that you have in your retirement account or in your personal brokerage uh, account. That's how you accumulate large funds uh, and, and, and because it grows uh, over time. And, uh, and, it, and it recognizes the fact that the cost of construction isn't static, the cost of units isn't static. You need to grow the fund in order to keep up with subsidies for affordability, in order to keep up with uh, the, the underlying costs of uh, construction for the units, in order to make sure you know, this is a long-term program that's going to be here for 20 to forever years. And, uh, you know, we, we need to be uh, committing to, to the funding for it. So I just want to note that. Uh, but to take a step back, I think we spent a lot of time, you know, diving into the, the, the nitty gritty details of this. I think that's really important for this committee. But I think we need to take a step back and talk about, you know, why uh, is this, you know, really important and why, at least as one committee member and somebody who's uh, who, who's been uh, reviewing this for, for quite some time uh, that I'm so excited about it. Uh, one, uh, this is one of the few ways that we have demonstrated that we can really take a big bite out of our housing goals, which other than that, we've been nipping at the, uh, you know, at the edges, but we haven't really been able to take that big bite. This would help us really take that significant big bite that we have been talking about that we, that we want this, you know, puts us in a position that's just one part of a broader goal and a broader strategy, but a very significant one uh, in order to have our actions really meet our rhetoric in terms of our housing targets and our housing goals without something different, without changing the way that we do business. We can't uh, through the traditional funding uh, through the HIF on a, you know, standard capital stack, we're not going to address in a significant way uh, the, the massive needs that we have uh, in, in that we have to leverage the money. We have to exponentially increase our capacity to meet our housing targets. And this is by leveraging at 25 to one, or I would suggest 37 to one, um, you know, this is the type of exponential increase that we need in order to reach those significant uh, targets that we've set out uh, to do. And in order to you know, meet with our funding commitments, the rhetoric that we have uh, so uh, frequently committed ourselves uh, to as a county. It's also recognition that we don't solve our housing problems without producing more housing. Uh, you know, th 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 this is a, uh, a subsidized reaction to market conditions. And that's what the housing market is. It's a marketplace and we need to be participating in that marketplace. And this allows us to participate with a much larger stack, uh, you know, on, on our side with our uh, with our housing opportunities commission, our public housing uh, authority. So, uh, you know, I, the, the the ability to reach 
that is significant to me. The uh, fact that we can leverage uh, private and, 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 and nonprofit with the HOC, with their bonding ability, which is unique. There is no other uh, organization. There is no other entity in Montgomery County that can do this. So, you know, with the question of why in this way and why in this manner, because there's no other way to do it. There's no other organization that can issue government bonds like this to leverage the funding to meet the goals that we desperately need in order to make our commitments possible. And this helps to make our, 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 our commitments possible. So uh, can I just ask uh, one, one question about the MPU program? And that's the other, let me just say one more thing. The best part about this is that while it is trailblazing and new and significant and innovative, it's also not new at all. It's something that we've done before through the MPDU program. So it's both proven and new, and you don't get that uh, opportunity very often to do something that's been uh, done before. We are not reinventing the wheel. We're repurposing the wheel to meet the modern needs of the housing crisis as we face it today in Montgomery County. And that to me is the, is the best part of this. But uh, on the MPDU program, does the MPDU program pay back uh, with interest the HIF? So, um, so while the bonds were outstanding, um, the county charged interest, and um, after the bonds uh, paid off, the county made the decision that um, it would not charge interest on on that fund, and so there is currently no interest charged. So we started doing that and then realized that we were kind of right. and, cutting and because, off our nose to spite our face because our goal was to purchase MPDUs to and, increase and, and also um, because it was the county's contribution to HSC's housing efforts. Uh, that was really the strategy at the time. So, Right. Okay. I, I um, appreciate that. I Like I said, I think that we should reinvest uh, the funding for this program, if we're going to do it, I think we should do it right. And if we're going to leverage it, we should leverage it to the extent uh, that that we can in order to meet our uh, housing targets. And uh, 37 to 1 is better than 25 to 1. I'm not great at math, but I'm good enough to know that. And so oh, that I means... raise that. Let me, uh, good comments, Andrew. Thank you. Let me pause here because I know Linda wanted to make some comments and Mary Beck, but Zach, is this, uh, is there any other key slide in the presentation? Um, um, I think uh, it's probably a good place to pause if we there's some details Great. beyond this that if we want to jump back to that's that's fine but otherwise it's there for your information all right why don't you unshare your screen for sure. a moment? we may come back to some of the slides um, and we'll now hear from Linda and then we'll hear from Mary Beck so I just wanted to um say that in the packet of information that you got, there's a draft of a CIP amendment. HOC has indicated that as with actually the other uh, funds that you just mentioned, like the MPDU revolving fund, um, that they they need to have a project in the CIP for uh, reference by their bond council. So there is a draft of a uh, PDF uh, I would say that staff in that draft of the PDF is showing the loan repayment as a source of funding to pay for the 3.4. So it is the model of the, um, after the first year, it would be assuming all goes as planned, $900,000 of current revenue and then 2.5 million of loan repayment would, would be as a source of funding for the project, although the key issue is that the county is committed uh, to making a $3.4 million payment to HOC the way that the PDF is set up. Um, it is not county debt service, so it is the commitment of a cost in the CIP, which is a little different. Um, it's not county debt, so it's not county debt service. I, I would just say as we think through in this <laughs> initial step, of how the committee wants to structure the PDF, um, given the current fiscal situation, uh, I would I would um, say that I think uh, not over committing 
the use of current revenue. Uh, even though we have set aside the 6.8 in this current year, we would need to go back, I think, and look at the fiscal plan for the housing initiative fund, since that is the source of where the current revenue came from. Um, I would say that that assuming at least in these initial years, uh, having the loan repayments support this in council staff's view is helpful given the current fiscal situation. I mean, we're, you know, our, we're sort of in this crisis mode of not quite understanding where all of our finances are. Uh, the council can always go back in a future year and determine that there is sufficient current revenue to fund this project with current revenue and then have the loan repayments be restructured back into the fund. So making a decision now doesn't necessarily preclude you from uh, changing how you wish to invest in this fund in the future. But I did, I did just want to say that, and I did just want to emphasize that part of the committee's actions are going to be um, the need to recommend to the council a CIP amendment uh, with an appropriation attached to it. Right now, I think of the funding sources that we have, current revenue and loan repayments are the two funding sources that can be used. This is not something where you can use PAYGO or some of the other non-debt um, funds in the CIP, I think under the current structure of those revenues. So I did just um, want to make sure that you did have a focus on the need to set up a, a CIP project uh, and have that go forward to the council. Thank you. Mary Beck? Yes. Um, I did want to say that there's an important piece here that really is missing in the analysis. And that is any opportunity for our finance department to review this. They have not, and we need our finance department to review this. Um, we need to look at what kind of commitment the bond council is asking for and how that affects how we, we do our books. HOC is listed as a component unit in the county's CAFR and I think that um, there's an attempt here to try to make debt not look like debt, but it really is debt and someone will really be paying the debt service. And I do not know how our accounting staff, our finance people will feel like we have to account for this. Um, and I think that that's the, that's the fundamental economics, whether it's our debt or their debt, it's still being paid for. And so I think that that's something that we have to look at. No such um, thing as a free lunch. There okay, isn't. Yes. Thank there, you for saying that. Yeah. No, there isn't, but I also want to point out that there's no attempt to make it look like anything other than bond issuance, which is, we all well know is debt. But I think uh, in I, terms I, of how it's, how it's characterized in the county's books. I, I understand well, I, that. But I, I just want to, I want to, for the record, since you said it, uh -huh. point out that there is absolutely no attempt to make it look like anything other than bond financing that is in okay. fact paid for. Um, we haven't, and that's not a, um, that's not an analysis. That's, that's an addition. That's not our analysis. That's the county's analysis. So we, we recognize that we're, we're, we're obviously going to uh, work with whomever we're, we're charged to. This was a, a, a step in the, in, in the process but there isn't an attempt to avoid having a conversation or, or many conversations with, with you or, or anyone else in, in county finance. We need to talk to finance about this and see how sure. it would be treated. We don't um, disagree. I think uh, absolutely. And I think to be transparent here, this will have some effect on the county's debt affordability markers. Right. I think that's the answer to your question. Yes. We, and I understand that we understand that, yeah. that, you know, when it comes to looking at the overall debt load of the county and how we measure that in different ways and how much we can afford, this right. this bill get counted, it does not count towards our GO bond limit. It does not count towards the amount of money that we can spend on school construction only indirectly in that how much can we afford, you know, this this program will move numbers, I think, in a very marginal way around overall affordability. But it's real. I'm not, I don't think we yeah. should also say that it's not real. It is real. Yeah. You know, I, I think, think it really to... depends. 
on whether, you know, we're doing what Mr. Freitzen or Council Member Freitzen suggested, whether loan repayments are helping out with it or not, especially in the early years. And the prior debt, as was mentioned before, there was the early repayment for the interest, and then the money was allowed to revolve and continue. And that was shown in the county's debt service budget. That was a part of the debt service budget in the county. So that one was treated differently. So I think that, you know, and frankly, it's a little bit confusing with some of the prior slides. It felt a little bit like there were some things, assuming loan repayments or not assuming loan repayments, and whether we have just one $50 million slug or two $50 million slugs. Those are decisions we haven't yet made that we need to make, and I'm hoping we'll make today. And then as we go to the full council, we would have a presentation based on the actual recommendation of the committee. Okay. I would hope, I would hope, I don't know when your next committee meeting is, but I would hope our finance department would have had a chance to give you information before the committee would make a recommendation. So you would fully understand. Sure. And we have, we have spoken with the finance experts. Not ours. Well, perhaps. So we can get more feedback and we'll need more feedback. We're not rushing and certainly would welcome that. So just to be clear on that point, and that's a pretty significant point. One, I agree with Councilman Friedson that the money should be reinvested. I just want to say that I agree with his rationale there. But to the point of having complete information from finance before we take action today and make a committee recommendation, were you agreeing with that, Mr. Reamer? Because I think that's prudent. Well, I think we should make a committee recommendation today. I think we should also receive finance feedback. We don't have to rush it to full council. We have a number of additional conversations that we're going to have at committee about other housing initiatives. So we can read in committee with that information. If we feel that there's something that we would need to revisit as a result, we would have the ability. Could I, could I suggest, you know, saying what we need to do, I think the committee gets to decide what we need to do and don't need to do respectfully. I, you know, Ms. Beck, I take the point that you've made. I'm very familiar with, with cappers and, 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 and I worked on the state capper, you know, in my previous role and understand where you're coming from on that. I would suggest that we have, you know, part of the issue that you're raising is that we don't have a recommendation. We have a proposal that has a number of components in it and a number of decision points that are part of it. So I would suggest respectfully, if the chair is okay with it, and I think this speaks to council member Jawando's point of prudence, that we have a preliminary committee recommendation that is specific of how much money we want to put in in FY21 and FY22. It sounds like we want to reinvest the funds that we have a specific proposal before and that we get the feedback of finance on that specific proposal. Because it's, it's, it's hard to provide feedback on a moving target. It's much easier to provide feedback on a specific proposal. And then if based on those, you know, that information, if the committee chooses to amend and change and tweak the recommendation in order to address any issues that are raised, then we can, but we would have something specific on the table in order for all of us to be, you know, basing our opinions off of and our analysis off of. Much easier. To your point, the next committee meeting on housing finance is going to be taking up a similar strategy of creating new debt using HIF resources. So, you know, we have to ultimately consider all of these things together. You know, we can't, we can't make one decision without recognizing that the next decision will relate to it. So, you know, this is something that I want to get all of this resolved as quickly as we can. I certainly want to get it resolved before we go to August recess, but we have some time to see how these pieces fit together. That would be, that would be helpful. And I think really we need to be involving finance on the upfront because last week we were scrambling around trying to find out what the heck this was. But that's what today was for. That's what today was for. Today was for the presentation 
of mm -hmm. the strategy in a public setting, mm -hmm. and now it will go to finance, comments, we'll hear, perhaps we'll hear from, you know, anybody who's interested. Um, but that's that's the way I wanted to structure the process is okay. just to give the HOC a chance to put the idea out on the table and the committee members a chance to chew on it and think about a, a, a recommendation, recognizing that uh, we, really we do need to know what are we going to do with the Purple Line Corridor and the other housing finance strategy and, and, the, and the Executives Opportunity Fund. You know, that's another big piece here. And I think we ultimately have to look at all three of these things together because we're going to be pushing as much as we can, but we need to know, you know. And I don't recall being, I don't recall being, I mean, maybe other members of the committee were, but I don't recall being consulted on the Housing Opportunities Fund before it was included in the budget. So I just right. uh, would, 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 would note that. I mean, nobody's, you know, making formal decisions True as well. <laughs> about it, but I just, you know, think that, uh, you know, there's a way that the process works. The county executive proposes budgets. We re review things. I mean, there's a, a process here. Ultimately, the, the council uh, makes the decisions on uh, on, on on appropriations. You know, the only other thing that I would say is we, we do, I mean, the HIF in and of itself bonds money with taxable debt. I mean, that was, that you know, that is what we do. There is a plan uh, for that. We've been doing that uh, for years. The, the, the question uh, is, is how that's done, where that's committed. Uh, the question of reinvestments uh, to me is uh, more a question of how much we're going to commit uh, for, for how long and what years. I mean, those are important tactical uh, decisions, but, um, you know, that's the way that the, the process works. That's the way that the process ha has, has always worked. Uh, and it's, it's, it's an amount question of, you know, how, how much of this cash can we afford? It's, it's, it's less a question of our ability to repay the debt that gets issued because we're not issuing the debt. HOC is issuing. Except we're going to, we're committing to pay it. That's what I think we're being asked to do is to commit we're, to pay we're, it. We're committing to pay not the 50 million. We're committing to pay the, 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 the 3.4 or 2.8 in the first, uh, in, in the first year. Again, I'm, I'm well aware of, of, of the, of the commitment that's, uh, that's being made. And, and the mm -hmm. question on that is just simply how much we're, committing to pay if, if we're getting repayments back it's just skimming off the top some of the commitment that we're asking to make again a perfectly legitimate question and it's just a question of you know what is our commitment to reach the 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 unit goals and the housing goals and the affordability goals that we have all right um why don't we open the floor to uh mclean and Shane, if you'd like to add anything, you don't you don't have to, but uh, certainly you're here and you're part of this conversation, certainly. And yeah, this is uh, Shane. Sure, well, please, uh, Shane, go ahead. Thank you. Um, again, uh, my name is Shane Pohl, and I'm the director of development of the Duffy Companies. Uh, the Duffy family uh, and family of companies have been developing in Montgomery County since 1953. Uh, we were headquartered in Hillendale, uh, for about 40 years. And um, first of all, I just appreciate the opportunity to speak here and, um, and participate uh, and, and continue the great work that we think we're doing with our partners. Uh, Stacy, Zach, Kareen, you know, they've been wonderful partners and, and we uh, have partnered with various companies over the years, over the decades. Uh, and I'd say that none have been uh, finer partners uh, to work with in HOC. And I think that while we're looking at all these uh, financial questions, I think we might be missing a couple of the other points of leverage uh, that a program like this really helps to uh, create and reinforce. So if this discussion has been up at 100,000 feet, uh, providing information uh, about how the economics are gonna work in finance, I'd like to bring it back all the way down to the project scale and then to the community scale and just give you our experience in working in Hillendale, right? Uh, Hillendale is in Eastern Montgomery County. Uh, we've been challenged uh, to, uh, to bring forward uh, new developments uh, over the decades. Uh, I think that the, the challenges of Eastern Montgomery County are, are well-documented. 
And for a long time, we, the Duffy family and companies have felt like we're carrying a lot of uh, water there. Uh, and along comes the opportunity uh, to partner with HOC uh, on uh, Hill and Bell Gateway, right, at the intersection of New Hampshire Avenue and the Beltway. And at the very uh, finite project uh, level, uh, we find that increasingly developers, other developers, uh, present company excluded uh, with EYA and Bazudo, uh, but there are more uh, merchant uh, or programmatic uh, developers who are not looking at the long-term uh, view on the actual projects that we're building, building for resiliency, building for sustainability, uh, those are building for durability. Those are the things that we as long-term holders and family uh, real estate uh, developer have focused on. And we've found our interests to be very well aligned with HOC in this area. So it's not just numbers on a paper for units. All units are not the same units. Uh, units uh, that are built the way that we're trying to build units are more durable, more energy efficient, conserve water. It's all of the things that the other committees that I'm also trying to participate in, in the county are trying to encourage. And that type of development isn't development that you find everybody willing to entertain and to encourage and to invest in the way that HOC has been willing to do that with us. Um, and so I think that's one point that we want to make and our willingness and our interest in expanding the sustainability of our projects when we go to HOC uh, and discuss what we're doing in the areas of zero net energy and the areas of passive house, uh, we find uh, a ready ear and an eager partner uh, and, and not only to implement them on the projects that we're working on now, uh, but they have the ability to implement what we're doing on a much broader scale than even on the paper that you see. So, for example, when we introduce the idea of all electric buildings and using induction cooktops, uh, which can be safer uh, to particularly age restricted properties. And we see HSC saying, hey, that's a that's a technology that we can implement across the portfolio. That's not reflected on any of the things that we see today, but that's the type of, of investment in those areas that we will see broader dividends on. That's at the project level. And then not coming all the way back out, but out a little bit on a community level. Uh, same thing. I mean, Eastern Montgomery County, we're fortunate to be home to the United States Food and Drug Administration, the consolidated headquarters. Pillando Gateway happens to be one mile south, also on a future BRT station. And so we, of course, need density uh, to address the issues we've discussed. But we need density in locations that are supportive of transit. Uh, Right? And we need density in places that make sense, like coming for FDA. But we also have transportation issues in the county. And I can tell you that HOC has been standing by our side as we're working with the Montgomery County Department of Transportation, as we work through park and planning, to try to address issues so that those numbers that we see on the page, they don't tell the whole story. There's a community here. And HOC is valuing more than just putting those units on the ground. They're saying, how do we put projects on the ground that are assets not just for the residents, but to the broader community. And I think Hillendale is a great example of that, where we participated heavily uh, in working on the local area transportation improvement program that's been there and HOC's willingness to say, yes, let's see what we can do to actually solve transportation problems and utilize the funds that would be available through programs like that and to actually make investments. And it's not all partners that, that operate this way. And those are the types of things that also are not reflected on the presentation. So as each of these seeds is planted and then grows and reseeds and replants, uh, it's not just those numbers, but it's what HOC who's placing a value on things more than just the project and making sure that that project has a balanced return. I think uh, uh, Commissioner Stan mentioned, you know, like it's, it's these projects being mixed income both for social reasons and for financial reasons as a private and partner in the projects. It's important that we're investing in these projects and we're participating in these projects with our time and our resources, that we also have confidence that, that they can be sustainable financially, sustainable both uh, you know, economically, socially, uh, and financially. And so I just wanted to lend some flavor and try to bring some character to these projects because it's not just uh, the unit count uh, and the numbers, uh, but it's what this is enabling 
uh, in communities and on projects uh, at scale. Good comments. Thank you. Uh, well taken. See, we're joined by Bob Young and Tob, the Y and EYA. Um, thank you, Bob, for your years of work with the county. Uh, I really like Duffy Companies. EYA has been at the forefront of innovation and affordable housing, partnering with HOC, bringing communities to life that really match our county's goals and are delivered, you know, in, with a high quality and an, an affordability to the county that uh, I think really is the envy of jurisdictions across the country. So uh, McLean and Bob, would like to share some thoughts. Uh, sure. sure. Let me just, uh, just say a brief introduction. I'll turn it over to McLean. Um, I've been on the whole time on uh, Council Member Reamer, just so you know, just that my video is off. Um, thank you for letting us participate this morning, um, Council Member Friedson and Council Member Juwando. Um, really appreciate your comments as well on this. And, and I just want to just say that, you know, EYA, we've been in business now for uh, just under 30 years um, with, uh, I think, a reputation. Most people know us as primarily a market rate developer. Uh, but in 2016, we were recognized in the county as the uh, county's leading affordable housing developer. And we've been very active both in the city of Alexandria, um, in the district as well, working with their housing um, authorities in effect, much like HOC in Montgomery County, and obviously had the chance to work uh, very closely with HOC on the Lindley. And I think um, the vision that HOC has laid out um, that's being supported by, uh, by the council members here and the committee um, in whatever form that it ultimately takes, I think is a bold vision that's much needed as a county resident for over 40 plus years. Um, you know, we have an opportunity to, to leverage the financing capabilities and the, the skills of HOC um, with the work that's done in the private sector. And I think that's where, you know, this idea has so much power that there are a number of projects in various pipelines, whether it be HOC's pipeline, our pipeline, the Duffy Company's pipeline, um, that can produce significant amounts of new housing. And, you know, the combination of the private sector skill set with uh, the financial capabilities and the mission of HOC, I think, can go a long way to uh, making a dent in what is a kind of a, a overwhelming housing need that exists in the county at all different income levels. McLean, I I'll turn it over to you, but uh, we're excited to be a part of it. Look forward to, uh, you know, working closely with uh, both the council um, and the county executive uh, to advance, um, you know, those objectives and obviously closely with HOC and are thrilled that um, one the projects that we've been involved with um, at Shady Grove would be uh, one of the first projects to move forward um, under this new um, this new initiative. Thank you, Bob. Thanks. Sure. I just wanted to add a couple couple of points of um, detail to to Bob's comments. And you know, first, as Bob mentioned, uh, mixed income housing, affordable housing, and partnership with housing agencies is a major part of our business model now, and it is a major part of our mission as an organization. Uh, creating affordable and mixed income communities is a big part of why many of our team members are at EYA, something we take uh, tremendous pride in, uh, and that we have had the good fortune of working with these multiple jurisdictions or multiple housing agencies in doing. The, the, uh, and just thinking about this initiative today, you know, HSC is quite unique from some of the other partners we've had uh, uh, the chance to work with in the housing agency arena in that they are um, – uh, both from a financial strength and from a uh, internal capacity standpoint, a truly differentiated uh, housing agency. I think it uh, for the county to be trying to tackle uh, the the challenge of affordable housing with an organization that is as sophisticated as HOC is a tremendous asset that that most jurisdictions, most large jurisdictions like the county, just don't have. Uh, they don't have organizations with the level of staff sophistication, with the level of financial capacity, uh, bonding capacity. Uh, or, or really thought leadership and development capacity in-house that HOC has. And so I do think that the county is really fortunate to have a partner like HOC in addressing this problem that, that uh, I think many jurisdictions, you know, frankly, would envy. Um, but I think, you know, some of the things that as we think about uh, what makes this initiative attractive as far as addressing the housing crisis more than just an accelerant to – HSC's mission, 
is to think about what what potentially attracts the private sector to become part of HOC's mission and to become part of addressing this problem. And so if I think about what this initiative and what the Housing Production Fund would do to the private development sector, in addition to, uh, to HOC's existing pipeline, it's things like bringing uh, an incentive to increase the amount of affordable housing in a community beyond the NPDU level. So if, if there is an attractive source of financing with a sophisticated partner who can come to the table, uh, that becomes something very appealing to the private sector to bring projects to HOC and say, how can we work together? How can we partner? Um, and how can we do more with this asset that we've been working on with this idea that we have? So I think that the idea of having an attractive financing tool with a sophisticated partner will actually um, source new jobs uh, to HOC will actually encourage the private sector to increase the components of affordability within their projects um, to be able to partner with HOC in that capacity. Uh, and then I think also it will do something that is particularly an acute need right now, uh, which is to take a little bit of the market timing risk out of a project. So if I think about the Duffy companies or EYA or, or any of the other private developers uh, um, in the county right now, the status of COVID, the status of the economic conditions, have all of us, you know, looking in the mirror, just like the county's doing and saying, what's next? What's the right decision for our projects? Does it continue to make sense to spend money in pursuing these potential development opportunities? Um, when you have the ability to increase the amount of affordable housing in a project, you reduce the market rate risk of that project. You're, there is an, an infinite demand for units at 50% AMI that rent for an average of $1,000 a month. I think we all know that. Um, but what it also does is it creates a source of capital that is less capital market dependent, that is uh, more stable during a challenging market environment than private capital market. And it will allow projects that might otherwise be stuck looking for private capital, private financing, um, that might be stuck on the sidelines and not able to go into production. It will allow those projects to move forward. So I think it does more than just accelerate the HOC pipeline. That's interesting. But as you said, that's it incentivize, incentivizes additional affordable housing. Because if one of those projects wants to come off the sideline and get into this pipeline, then they're going to be providing affordability that they would never provide as a purely market project. You're not 12.5% NPDU anymore. You're, you're 30% at deeper levels. At 30% 30, 30%, but then two-thirds of that is 50% AMI or below which is right. impossible, frankly, you know, that doesn't happen under the MPDU program without additional subsidy. We have to buy those units down one at a time typically, which we do, but it requires a lot of annual cash. Here we're going to be creating them right from the beginning, uh, which is one of the more exciting elements of this. This is, it's rare to be able to get new development with such a significant affordable and deeply affordable component. Um, thank you, McLean. Thank you, Bob. Uh, again, over the years, I've been on the council 10 years, and EYA has been such a partner to the county, helping achieve our vision of inclusive communities, uh, living in high-quality homes uh, in all parts of the county. You know, that's uh, that's what you do, and um, I really appreciate that. And your your vision, working with HOC, has created the possibility. And here we're talking about how can we take HOC to scale now? And how can we create a solid, reliable pipeline um, that would uh, enable us to, to hit some big goals? So Zach, I wanted to ask you, and I think it's time to turn to the committee members for recommendation. Can you talk about what, uh, talk to us about the number, numbers of units um, that you can create per, again, $50 million tranche. And if we were to do two $50 million tranches, what is the number of units that that means? And then I think it's worth noting, I, I did a little calculation on what we would pay uh, through our subsidy effectively per new affordable unit. And it looks to me like it's a very attractive expenditure, you know, a very attractive subsidy level. Uh, we don't have to spend that much money to create a new affordable unit, uh, certainly compared to other 
ways that we have, for example, the impact tax waiver, I think this would be a far more efficient way for us to create new affordable units, including units that are below 50% AMI, which we don't do through the impact tax waiver. So, um, Zach, can you talk about the overall picture for per $50 million tranche, what, what we can create again? Uh, yes. So, um, so again, the nice thing about the simplicity of this is that, you know, it's pretty much straight line. So um, as we mentioned in the packet at 50, you're talking about 3,500 3, units over 20 years. If the project interest is not reinvested, if it is reinvested, then you're talking about, you know, 4,400, 4,375. And so if you move to a hundred million dollars, you can double those numbers. So you're at, um, you know, um, what's that? 7,000 or, uh, 8750. So, um, it's straight line. Um, and, um, and I don't, did you want me to speak a little bit to the per unit cost or? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and just, just as a comparison, um, you know, uh, uh, regardless of the amount of the issuance, if the, if the project interest is not reinvested, let me see here, uh, it looks like the HPF would account for about 65,000 per affordable unit um, and 52,000 per affordable unit. If it is reinvested, then you get um, about $48,000 per affordable unit um, if the interest is not reinvested and, and about $39,000 per affordable unit if the interest is reinvested. So this is, you know, all part of the leveraging, um, the benefit of the leveraging here, but um, it's really, um, it's really a nice and relatively inexpensive way to deliver these uh, units to the market. Linda, you have a question, and then Mary Beck, you have a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to um, make a comment as the committee is going to discuss its recommendations. So since this would be a CIP amendment, and since HOC is looking uh, to use this financing as soon as it can for pipeline projects, I think there is an interest in either being able to go to action um, before council's recess or potentially um, if if we couldn't get there to do it right when we come back in September. Uh, but so it would be helpful, I think, if the committee, since the CIP amendment takes some time, it probably would be helpful if the committee were willing to have um, a CIP amendment put forward sooner rather than later, even if we end up through the process then amending it further. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I do think it's, it I, I do think just from a procedural and timing, we need to get something introduced that can still be worked on, but that will help us to make sure we can get to action. I see the point being, we have to introduce the CIP amendment. Right. And, and, that's usually like a three week process if you're going from introduction to action. So. Okay. That's helpful. Mary Beck, did you want to add uh, something? I just, I just had a clarifying question. So the County, I think would be spending about $68 million for a $50 million tranche. That's the debt service costs. And Zach, I think you said there would be 3,500 units. Um, produced over the 20 years. Is that right for the 68 million? So, sorry about that. Um, so if it is, um, so for the, at the $50 million, um, at the $50 million level. Um, 50 million is the sum of 20 years of 3.1 right. million. Yeah. 68 million is the, the sort That's of not non-time value of money weighted um, mm -hmm. amount, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. The good question was on the units. The the second part of that question. Okay. Was, yeah. yeah. Just if you could complete the. What do you get for that? I think she said thirty five hundred. Yeah. Is that is that correct? Yeah, thirty five hundred, and then just if assuming. If you don't reinvest in forty three seventy five, if you do reinvest, and right? It's in the it's in the presentation and. Thirty-eight seventy-five. So uh, it's uh, forty-three seventy-five if you do reinvest. Forty-three seventy-five if you do reinvest. Eight hundred. Yes. Yeah. Eight hundred seventy-five additional units based on the fifty million dollar tranche based on reinvesting. Yeah. If that's what's noted in the presentation and in the packet and has been noted a few times. 
Okay, over 20 years though, right? That's what I'm trying to understand. Yes. Okay. But I think you also need to consider the amount of loans that are made over that 20 years if you're if you're um, selling the um, the annual amount. You can't ignore the fact that uh, there's 250 million in loans made if it, if the funds aren't reinvested. That's an important component because it's it revolves. They're bridge. Well, that's, that's these these are construction bridge loans. I mean, yeah. I think I mean that, that I don't think that's been fleshed out as much as it could have been, but. It's yeah. basically, as as Ms. Brown noted earlier, it's effectively a four-year time horizon. You've baked in five years to be safe in your analysis on the 5%, as far as I could tell. But basically, you're talking about a four-year construction loan, and then the projects get refinanced, and the funds get returned, and that's what creates the revolving loan program, and that's how the leveraging as was noted earlier goes from the standard level of leveraging in a traditional HIF or other model to exponentially bigger than that to the 25 or 37 right. to one option yeah yep. I, I think that's the that's the appealing part of the that's what right. we all like I mean, right yeah. right I just yeah I just think of, yeah that yeah yeah and the, really the two points of leverage are uh, that the revolving nature of the fund is point of leverage number one, and then the fact that it goes into transactions as a, a you know a small component of the overall capital stack, and so it's getting leverage within the projects it gets loaned into at a, again about four to five four or five to one. So that's why it's pretty you know twenty five to one is basically you know five on the revolution and then five again on um, how it sits in the capital stack. So okay. on the one tranche versus the two tranche in the, the in the proposal, it looks like it's F21 and 23, as a, and you, you mentioned, uh, Chair Reamer, potentially 22. I think if we could talk about that, and then I think that. at some point, get back to my other point yeah. about affordability. Too. Yeah, so I, I'll propose, you know, I, I like I said, I think we should have a proposal on the table. I think we should formally introduce it. I think finance should weigh in on it before uh, – Full council votes on it, but I would propose that we uh, do the two tranches currently as proposed as uh, in the packet as FY21 and 23. I'd propose FY21 and 22, 50 million dollar tranches each, um, and for the funds to be reinvested uh, as opposed to repaid uh, back to the HIF. And I think you know that then should be. Uh, analyze we should work off of that as our proposal and we can tweak from there accordingly based on feedback that we receive from finance and numbers that we uh, that we get based on based on that so you would be increasing the debt service shortly to 6.8 million a year is that what we're saying in fy22 that would be we would we are just and just to be clear we're talking about dedicating funding from the HIF. I mean, I think the, right. the, the the misconception that, Ms. Beck, you've had the entire meeting has been on increasing debt. What we're talking about is committing and dedicated existing cash in the HIF that is being used for affordable housing and redirecting it in a more thoughtful and more committed way in order to better leverage to meet our significant housing commitments. Okay, that was just, I just had a clarifying question for Linda. Linda, on the draft PDF, you just show this as current revenue. You don't say HIF specifically. And I guess I thought Mr. Reamer had said there was yet another slug of debt that was going to be proposed he, in a later he, meeting. Yes, I did. I did say that. Okay. Uh, so. so Next conversation of the Fed committee will be on leveraging the remaining FY21 component of the cash that we set aside. And, and separately, we also have a conversation about the opportunity fund, which is also on the table here. We're mm -hmm. going to hear about it shortly. So in FY21, the motion would commit $3.4 million. There's still some 
of the of the portion that we fenced off, there's still another three point four million dollars remaining, and then there's eight million dollars in the housing opportunity fund. In FY twenty two, the motion would expand that three point four to six point eight. Uh, so, you know, we'll have to take that into consideration as far as how it would impact the subsequent proposal that we want to make around debt financing. Okay, or the ability to fund other deals in the HIF without significant increases in funding. Respectfully, why don't we have a committee recommendation and the executive branch can certainly weigh in at the appropriate time. Okay. On the committee's recommendation once finance reviews it, which you've already stated is something that you'd like to happen before all evidence to the contrary, but before the, the executive branch weighs in on. Yeah, if, if, I, if, if I could jump in again, I I understand the proposal, Mr. Friesen. I just want to understand why we're, HOC's proposal is to have it in the saying they could be available. I understand the first 50 million, but then the other one was kind of slotted for 23 and they'd be standing by if, if I'm paraphrasing Zach's comments. And with the climate that we're in and the context and that there's more proposals to look at, uh, I, I guess I'm not understanding the rationale and the, you know, I, I have a little hesitancy of moving the other 50 million back to 22 at this point. So that's what I'm trying to understand. From question. Colin. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, there was a specific reason it was suggested. Uh, let's, let's hear a little bit more about that. Well, why don't we let HOC weigh in on that? That's I think I mean. the chair yeah. is. Well, look, I mean, look, Kat, I'm directing that question to HOC. I think broadly, we're going to do what's in the best interest of all partners, county included. So uh, whether it's 22 or 23 for us, I mean, it's, it's clearly not our decision. We're not going to say no to additional capital to support our affordable housing mission. That that noted, it's in there in 23 because um, it, we, we, we're cognizant of the challenges that the, the county is facing. We um, are... Uh, part of the housing fabric here. Um, certainly interest rates are lower and, you know, likely to be lower in 22 than they are in 23, which, you know, gets us additional leverage opportunity. But you know, I don't want to, to, I don't want there to be this, this notion that HOC is pushing um, either way for 22 or 23. We're um, on that component. Uh, we're agnostic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, my 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 thought process here is that we are going to get. Uh, this is going to be reviewed by finance. We're going to have analysis. We're then going to ultimately make a decision. There was a suggestion that it potentially be moved up in order to get you know to to take advantage of uh, the interest rate environment, the current uh, needs and 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 pipeline uh, that exists. My view would be to get it analyzed at the most ambitious uh, of scenarios and allow us the possibility to revert back to the lesser but still ambitious of uh, scenarios. Uh, and so that's, you know, from my perspective of what I put forward, I put it forward with that in mind, noting that I see this as a, you know, preliminary committee recommendation that is going to get feedback. I, you know, it would be helpful for HOC to provide us with feedback of what that would mean for sure. The pipeline for affordability, et cetera, and feedback from uh, the executive uh, staff and, and finance uh, for their uh, views and, and positions of you know, what it would mean to dedicate uh, this level of uh, funding uh, out of the current revenue in the in, uh, in the HIP for, for affordable housing. Then from there, we can, you know, as was noted earlier, we can tweak and adjust accordingly, but I think it would be helpful to analyze it at this point and then uh, make a final decision accordingly. Yeah, agreed. Okay. And then I just have one other question. Yeah. The uh, On the affordability, we had some back and forth about it probably be able to do a little better, um, you know, than the 20 and 10, the 20. Uh, and, and so if we're moving forward, I want to ask yeah. HOC, yeah, can, can is there a is twenty five fifteen or is there some is there some, what's the flexibility and that can that be I need that to be part of the analysis whether we do it here today, or we look at it coming back. I think the general premise is that 
for moving it fast, we're, put, we're supercharging it. It's less costly. The interest rates are great. I'd like to see us state up front that we're going to over, you know, outdo what the normal HOC model would be. So I, 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 I'm agnostic. So I just wanted you to give me a chance to respond to that. Oh, no, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you. First of all, the, the whole conversation has been helpful. And as, as always, um, you all are aligned with uh, our mission and, and pushing us to do more. I think that's appropriate. I'm not going to do the analysis on the fly. Uh, we'll take a look at it. 25 and 15 is 40 percent, right? And there's some some other fundamentals, some operational fundamentals that we could go back and forth about, but uh, it's probably not the, the appropriate time to do it. Um, I, why don't we do the analysis, get back to you all within a, a relatively short period of time, You'll note, I wanted to uh, note that our, our chair, uh, Roy Priest, is, is, has been patiently and patiently observing the call, as I'm sure all of our other uh, commissioners are, or many of our other commissioners are. Uh, and so um, I, I, I'm confident that our commissioners are going to want to weigh in on that analysis, and so I don't want to short circuit that opportunity. Uh, when, so are we, when do we think we're slated to come back to you all uh, for discussion? And then that gives me at least a uh, well, what we would do, we would proceed to introduce a supplemental CIP amendment. So that would go, we would introduce that, then we would have a public hearing, and it would come to the committee. So that's when we would take up, you know, that, that would be the next obvious op opportunity. We could try to have an additional conversation along the way, but it may not really be needed. I think that's probably a good framework for us to return to this. All right. So I think that we can corral, uh, we can work with our commissioners uh, within the next um, uh, sort of 10 days and, and at least be back with an initial uh, set of thoughts around that. Is that fair? Yeah, that's, 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 that works. that's yeah, yeah. works for me. I'm fine with the proposal in light of that. And if Linda, you could just make sure that's noted that we follow up and it's captured, I'd appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Will what, do. What I want to just say for on that important point, you know, in my conversations with HOC, what they had been saying was our commission is going to push us to do better where we can. And every project is going to be evaluated on those terms. And this should be the standard. If we can do better, we will. Um, that, that was, you know, their, their framing of the affordability levels, recognizing that 20% of the building at 50% AMI or less is, you know, nobody else can do that. Nobody's doing that. Uh, and the additional 10% at MPDU level. And I, as we get into this conversation, I think we will want to look at what we pay per unit to help us think about the level of mandate. Um, because, you know, that's a just a So we'll include that in the analysis, um, uh, uh, Chair Reamer. And I think what uh, uh, Ms. Beck was pointing out was how much is the county paying for that. But I think, you know, when we look at it, we look at overall project cost uh, and that per unit. So we'll compare the, the two so that the analysis is a side by side and um, it also uh, pulls out the, the level of affordability. Okay, and, and I wanna be clear here when we're, part of the reason I'm pushing back is because when we think about affordability, I'm not thinking about it just for 15 years, which is the, the typical tax credit period of, of time, right? We're thinking about it perpetually. And so that's, those are the costs uh, and, and options that, that impact the analysis and um, the negotiation about what, what we think we can do reasonably, uh, but, but also um, we, when we deliver it, we want it to be exceptional. Well, and I would say what we have to keep in mind is if doing it the way we've looked at it so far means we get one more building, then doing it in a way with a heavier requirement, we probably have exceeded the benefits of the heavier requirement already just by getting one more building. So we got to think about how all those things fit together, I guess. Um, yeah, I just want to add one piece too. I mean, you know, if you look at the Lindley as well, the three bedrooms were a key component of that. That, that wouldn't have been as reflected in the number of units in a hard formula, but that was a priority that was made a very important one, one that I think that we're all very excited about. I think that, you know, that might be the greatest aspect of that building is the, uh, you know, the ability of the larger uh, units to be, uh, you know, particularly focused in 
uh, affordability categories that otherwise never would have happened and uh, is extremely rare if, if, if it happens anywhere uh, else. I haven't really seen uh, much, uh, if any, uh, of that to that extent of affordability. And so, you know, I, I do think, you know, HSE's job is every dollar that they have is for the purpose of creating affordable housing and making housing that exists more affordable for more people. And so, um, you know, I, I think, you know, yes, we should push, but uh, we also should uh, allow for some level of flexibility because uh, the, the needs of uh, tomorrow and the needs on a case-by-case -case basis might not be easily predicted uh, and scripted today. So, I, you know, I, I totally appreciate, and, and Councilmember Jawanda, you're always uh, pushing us on this, and I think uh, it's appreciated, but I also think that we, uh, we want to find that right balance where we're providing enough flexibility to actually meet the needs in real time on a project by project basis. And to me, that's part of the whole benefit of this project uh, to allow uh, HOC to leverage uh, the funds in order to create that level of flexibility and to fund the, the projects in the, the, the best, most effective uh, and most significant way possible. All right, well, um, so we're not, we have a preliminary framework. My understanding, I think all of us are in agreement, we'll draft a CIP uh, recommendation, FY21 and FY22, right, Linda? Uh, 50 and 50, and then um, we will assume for, uh, well, it's a separate, the issue of repayment is not in that appropriation or is it written into that appropriation? No, it would be in terms of, uh, if, if you wanna reinvest, then you would not show loan repayments as an offsetting source, source right. of the project. So. Okay. so we'll look at it as not showing that and we'll see ultimately how it fits in with the several priorities that we're going to be seeking to advance uh, on housing over the next uh, you know, month, month and a half. Sec okay, Linda, do you have uh, all the direction you need from us uh, on this item? I believe so. All right, terrific. Well, we'll move on to the presentation from DHCA. Again, thank you to HOC. Thanks for your leadership. Um, when, you, when we want to really get to the next level on housing, uh, to be able to have a partner with your success and, and skill set uh, is proving to be indispensable. And so thank you for that. Thank you. And thank you to Duffy and Neil uh, Bob, uh, thank you for your leadership over the years. Uh, just uh, you've contributed so much to this county and uh, we're all proud of you. And uh, thank you, McLean. Thank you, McLean, very much. Don't mean to undersell you there. You've done a great job too. <laughs> All right, um, let's move on to the next item. Thank you. Uh, we have DHCA here to present a, uh, give us an update on their model and we're not gonna be, we don't need to make a recommendation today. I think we're, we're just trying to absorb here. We have some questions I think we need to follow up with uh, in a similar manner, trying to see how all these pieces fit together. Uh, so and Director and we'll Nagam and uh, Deputy Director Mary are here to give you a presentation. I would just remind you that uh, in this case, there is a project that you approved in the CIP. You approved the expenditure schedule, but you did not appropriate to give you time to have further consideration um, of the model. So at some point when the committee is ready to make a recommendation, there would need to be a supplemental appropriation, not an amendment but a supplemental appropriation to the capital improvements program in order for the department to spend. Thank you. And again, I just wanna to, to frame this conversation. We, we're trying to hear more and learn more, ask some questions and that will help us as we proceed to make recommendations on all these things to see how they fit together. So today we're just trying to learn from the executive branch and then we'll follow up uh, subsequently. Linda, do you want to share the slides or do you want me to try to share the slides? Um, yeah. If you can share them, that would be great. Let me see if the technology is going to work. Our staff should assign you the ability to share. There you go. Uh, do you see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> technology worked. <laughs> great. Uh, well, it's still morning. Good morning. Asim mm -hmm. Negam, Director, DHCA. 
And today we are having a pretty lively discussion about housing, which is very timely in the, in the county. So earlier we talked about new production. Now we're going to talk about pres preservation. Just uh, quickly, just to set the stage, we know that there is a housing need among all income spectrum, uh, not just you know uh, at a certain level. That being said, the need is more profound for those folks who are earning at or below 50% of AMI. In the county, currently we have 20,000 households who are below 50% of AMI who are severely rent burden. And then according to the COG study, we need to serve another 20,000 households at or below 50% of AMI between January of this year and year 2030. So we have less than 10 years to serve another 20,000 households. So work is really cut out. And if you really look at different studies that planning has been doing, they're estimating that, you know, in the next 10 years, between now and 2030, the county stands to lose another 7,000 to 11,000 units in terms of affordability, unless we act quickly to preserve these units. So those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, this will be, you know, a good, to uh, uh, segue into what we are really proposing. We had a long discussion with the Fed committee in February, uh, but I know that uh, memory is fair, so it's to be a good refresher for them as well. So with the Opportunity Fund, we are creating a financing tool for affordable housing developers, both nonprofit and for-profit entities, to acquire and control properties and then position those properties for the long-term affordability. So as a part of the budget process, we had proposed from FY21, $10 million, one-time funding only, that would create a dedicated fund of 40 to $50 million. And the funds are expected to revolve after three years' time. As a part of the FY21 budget, the council programmed $8 million from the county CIP, but the money has not been appropriated yet. And the fund basically provides, oh, let me move the slides. Yes, I was going to okay. say, maybe you can uh, move the slides. There we go. Yeah. So the fund, the fund basically provides uh, uh, ready-to-go capital with certain predetermined uh, financing parameters set in. So that if I'm the developer, I, I go and quickly use this financing tool and acquire that property in a reasonable time frame. The fund is expected to uh, be funded by recordation tax premium from county CIV portion, as I mentioned earlier. And the fund will support preservation projects throughout the county, including transit corridors like Purple Line and it does not affect county's debt capacity. As I mentioned earlier, the, this is going to be another financing tool in our financing toolbox for the developers to reach out to and use it as they fit, you know, reasonable for their own financing structures. Right now, we can provide similar financing through HEF, but it's done on a case-by-case -case basis. Here, we are having the opportunity to create a fund, a pool of money for the developers to use. Basically, we are leveling the playing field for, for everyone here, whether you are a nonprofit or a for-profit developer. And if you really look at our affordable housing developers, they take about two to three years to put the financing together into the permanent financing. By the time they apply for credits, that's 9% or, or bonds, whether it's through the state or uh, applying for 4% credits, takes time. So this fund provides them the opportunity to acquire the project, stabilize those properties, and look, look for the financing, permanent financing during that three-year time period. And any interest payment or any debt service will be paid by the project, not, not by the county. As I mentioned earlier, the funds are expected to revolve after every three years. The, the ones that I used earlier in my prior life in Fairfax, they, we gave another two-month extension by payment of uh, you know additional fees. So a developer could have three to four years before the funds could be revolved. And the funds could be in a first lien position or a subordinate lien position. So we have an example over here. So if it's a $20 million transaction, and let's say $16 million comes from 
from another you know source which is 80 percent loan to value the 400 dollars could come from this overall fund and as the developer you know uh, looks for long-term affordability whether it's uh, look the housing tax rate is nine percent or four percent hip funds uh, federal home loan bank grant or any other financing source those funds can be covered together which is typically the case in any affordable transaction uh, if you look at any permanent financing structure i have two more slides after this uh, so i have a short presentation so in terms of what we have done we have met with the cdfis those people uh, who want to know what cdfis is community development financial institutions they are non-profits who manage leveraged acquisition and preservation funds and once the council appropriates the money to the fund, we expect the fund to be in operation in, in about six months time frame, working out the details of the procurement and the legal process. And this fund has been worked, you know, used successfully in several jurisdictions across the country, including Fairfax. So it's DC, Fairfax, Denver, Seattle, Bay Area, Boston, New York, and Minneapolis. And this fund basically provides long-term viability of a project in order to preserve affordability on a long-term basis. And let me see if I have any other more slides. I think I may have only seven slides. I thought we had eight. Uh, so I'll be happy to an answer any questions. As a affordable housing practitioner, I would say that we need to create more financing tools for our affordable housing developers so that we can keep those in our financing toolbox and provides a an menu of options for our developers to reach out to that toolbox and use a financing tool as they fit necessary for their own transactions. So the more of these financing tools we are going to have, the better it is going to be for our developers in the county to address the affordable housing need. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Maybe you'll unshare. Yeah, let me see. Uh, okay. okay, back now. Okay, um, I have a few questions. Um, colleagues will, you know, we'll open the floor here. Um, I want to start off. Why is this separate from the HIF? Why don't you just provide the same loan that you anticipate a project asking for, but provide it from the HIF? What, what is the value of creating this external fund? So as I mentioned, right now we can do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Here we are creating a fund so that everyone knows that this part of ready to go capital is available. And also we are leveraging these monies. We need only one-time funding from the county. We, we had proposed 10 million to the budget process, $8 million have been programmed. So we will leverage those funds with the private money to create this fund. So we see a win-win situation for the county and also for, our, for developers as such. And so can you provide some examples of CDFIs that you think would be? Likely? Sure, so we have spoken to LISC, Enterprise, National Housing Trust, and Frank helped me, it was LEF. Uh, there's another CDFI of whom, and everyone has provided great support to our, uh, you know, proposal here. They are all waiting that as soon as the council approves the money, they'll be ready to go. So we can go to the next step as soon as we have the funding available. Do you have any like letters of interest from CDFIs or anything? We, we, we have not seen uh, you know, letters of interest per se, because, you know, we, we need to have the funding available, but we had great conversation, multiple conversations with some folks. And we had face-to-face -face meetings, uh, you know, before COVID-19 situation. We know that this has been done, so we're not re reinventing the wheel here. This is not a new concept. Maybe it's, you know, it's new for the county, but not for other jurisdictions. This model has been replicated over and over again. So we are pretty sure that once the monies do become available, get appropriate to this fund, uh, we'll be able to put this uh, fund together in a reasonable amount of time. So just to be clear, what today what happens is a nonprofit wants to buy a building, 
they line up that CDFI themselves. They seek a loan from the county or some kind of financing from the county, which we provide through the HIF. Um, what you're trying to do is get some kind of advanced commitment from the CDFIs that they would match them funding that you would set aside and that that would expedite the process for an applicant. Is that is that correct? Correct. Um, so, so, so basically what we are dealing with here is we are negotiating the CDFI upfront that this will be the leverage fund. These will be the fin financing parameters for our developers to meet. So that there are no surprises from the get go. And then they, our developers know that this part of money is, is available, which can be used throughout the county for preservation purposes. But the key point I think is that you're envisioning this as short term finance so that the projects have to repay this fund pretty quickly. Uh, three, four years, I think you said something like that. Yes. So what we are envisioning is uh, funds will revolve after three years. So right. uh, in my prior life, I gave a couple of projects another six month extension. But this is all negotiated up front within our legal documents. So by payment of a few, you know, some fees, you can extend that that commitment by another six months or up to a year. So during that three year period, basically, uh, I mean, there will be access strategy. Uh, the permanent financing structure will be put together, which is typically the case in these transactions anyway. But this, you know, fund provides a breathing room to the developers to do acquisitions in a timely fashion and be able to put together the financing structure on a permanent basis. Okay, so two two points or questions. First, what I have heard from some nonprofit developers is that they don't have a problem getting short-term finance. That's not their problem. That their problem is getting long-term finance. And that the projects that would come through this pipeline at the end of the three years, they would need a HIF loan or some other type of long-term financing anyway from the county. Do you, do you think that is accurate? Do you think that as projects exit this, that they would have to come to the county for support? A couple of thoughts over there. <clears throat> You're right, some developers may have fully capitalized. They may not need this fund. That being said, we are opening the doors for other developers who want to come in and want to do affordable housing in the county. So this will be ready to go capital. Now, those developers who have their, you know, means to access the capital markets, they can reach out to their uh, lenders and we can still provide support financing through this fund because there's always that delta between the senior lender, you know, LTV and the support lender LTV. So that's where we come in. Yes, in terms of permanent financing, then as I mentioned several times, you know, before, we have to throw everything in the kitchen sink. So whether it's tax credits, uh, money's coming from HEF, federal home loan bank grant, or any other foundation money, or any other funds equity that can come in into the project. So all those things have to come in to make the permanent financing work. But again, I think the key value that you're trying to add here is that you're securing support from CDFIs in advance under existing uh, practice. The projects would secure that for themselves. There's a theory that this will enable them to get access to funding that they couldn't have gotten otherwise. Um, Correct. And I think that's something we, we need to hear from the, the the developers about their their sense of that value, um, and um, anyway, uh, I, I, get, I, I guess a follow up that... question on that. I mean, sure, sure. It, it seems. I mean, I, just in the same line of questioning, uh, and then I have a follow up on Mr. Nagam's comment about you could come out of this fund too. Um, so. The premise of the fund, to, to the point of the chair, is they. It, it used to be required effectively that you go to the CDFI or some other finance, and then you come to the county to fill the gap. And what this is saying is, 
you come to the county and the county will have already gone to the CDFI and created a fund where you basically go to a one stop for short term financing through the county. The premise behind that, at least I would presume, is that CDFIs were rejecting nonprofit and other affordable housing developers on projects for some reason, right? Whether they didn't find them credit worthy or they thought that the loans were too risky or some other factor, they were denying that. And so some of those affordable housing developers were going to the CDFI, couldn't secure the, the appropriate loan that they needed in order to make the project. And so they never were able to come to the county to get support for short-term financing because they weren't able to secure the first part of the deal. Is that accurate? What you just mentioned could be, you know, the case with, with a nonprofit <clears throat> because they have difficulty accessing capital markets. So as I mentioned earlier, we are leveling the playing field for everyone, whether you are a for-profit entity or a non-profit, so that you know what the fund is about, what the funding parameters would be, and you have ready to go capital. So if you were an entity with not many resources available to you, this will be a resource available to you. I mean, the purpose of CDFIs is to provide access to capital to those who might otherwise not be able uh, to get it. I mean, I, I think some of the reason why folks don't access capital, not all, is, you know, because the loan may carry more risk. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand what the existing problem is that the fund is intending to solve. And it seems like at least from what I've heard, there are some hypothetical issues that may be there for those who otherwise can't access capital, but it, it's it's unclear who, who that is, when that would occur, and what this fund, in terms of a gap, it would be filling. Well, let me try to answer this question this way. So right now the CDFIs have to underwrite every single project. So they have to look at, you know, from uh, their resources to what the project brings to the table. This way is helping the CDFIs too, because we're creating a fund and they, they're, they're helping creating a fund by leveraging private dollars. So in terms of their outreach and marketing and doing affordable housing transactions, it helps them as well in terms of marketing and outreach and providing affordable housing. So this way, they have set parameters for a fund which has been used beautifully in other places, including DC uh, and you know elsewhere in the, in the country. And DC has done multiple of these. So this is a model which has been proven successfully over and over again. So it's helping us as a county and also the CDFIs as well. I, I want to add the other component here that the developers and the CDFIs have explained relates to the competitive advantage of bringing in our investment. Our investment will make the combination of our money and the CDFI money more competitive. So to compete with well-capitalized developers, to be ready to respond to a market opportunity, uh, to not have to have the equity component and some of the higher cost components of the acquisition, uh, the models that we've looked at have shown that type of investment by a public uh, partner makes a big difference in making the bid competitive. So they do have access to other financing. This improves the competitiveness of the package of financing. Okay, could you so, share the models that you've looked, I mean, I just, I've never seen the models that you're referring to. Could you share that with the committee? Sure. So, to put it, see if I can put it this way, because it's helping me think about it. $8 million of cash creates, if we were to just use that to leverage debt, that would create something like a hundred million dollars in a in a debt fund, although we'd have to pay it off every year over time, or may, maybe more. Um, you're saying it's best for the county to put eight million dollars in cash on the table, not a hundred million dollars, because the private money that you're bringing in is private money that might not otherwise be available. The question that I have is: Is that really true, or not? 
if it's really true that that's money that isn't otherwise available, then it makes some sense. But if a project could get that investment from the CDFI as well, then we haven't really grown the pie of resources that are available to it. What we've done instead is continue to use cash for our housing financing when we could use debt and provide a lot more money up front and then spend it down. Um, so, the, you know, the key issue is how, how, how much money are you able to bring into the table? How much of an advantage is that to the partners as opposed to a larger fund at the county that, and then they would have to go to themselves, for, they would have to go for themselves to those other entities. Let, let me let me answer this question. Uh, we are we are growing the the pie over here. We are using one-time funds from the county, if it's eight million dollars or ten million dollars, whatever that number is, to create a fund of forty to fifty million dollars with leverage resources, which, if you look at our example will help leverage ultimately acquisitions to the tune of $240 million. So if this fund were to be created, that's how much leverage we are creating ultimately. So we are not only simply leveling the playing field over here, we are growing the pie. We are creating a financing tool for both the nonprofits and, and for-profit entities. There's no debt service that is being paid from the county on an ongoing basis, any interest payment or debt service will be paid by the, by the project, and we need only one-time funding from the county up front. Yeah. Could I, could I, if I could chime in, um, so, and I guess, Mr. N Director Nagam, you were saying that this is commonly done and there's, you listed a whole bunch of regional and, and uh, nationwide partners that do this. So I'm assuming there's some track record of being able to see these benefits of getting the getting new uh, people into the process of developing, uh, preserving affordable housing, rather, and, and then also uh, potentially maximizing uh, the leverage that you were just discussing. So could you talk about one? You know, I know we haven't done it this way yet, so you can't say exactly what's going to happen, but based on other places that have done it and maybe your previous experience, if you can give an example, that might be helpful. And then also in that context answer, you know, what, what do you see as the immediate uh, short term, medium term goal on how this, how much you could preserve and, you know, vis-a-vis -vis units, et cetera, based on the conversations you've had. Hopefully that makes sense. Sure. And we can, you know, get you the, uh, all the data that you need from different jurisdictions. And I'm going to have, uh, Frank, if you can share, if you have the information on the DC model, how many units they were able to do, how many projects. I can tell you that in Fairfax, before the housing market debacle and the money was uh, taken away, I gave back the money to, to the county, which went back to the general fund. I was able to do, during, this was a time when the condo conversions were happening, 2005, 2006 time frame. We were able to preserve, you know, at least a few hundred units. I don't have a firm number with me. You know, my uh, uh, memory is kind of rusty at this point. But we were able to do a few projects until the housing market debacle in 2008. And then the county said, well, we want our money back, you know, for other uses. So I, I gave the money back to the, to the county. That being said, in other jurisdictions, the program is still running, including DC. So, Frank, I don't know if we have the information with you. Otherwise, uh, uh, Councilman Javanda, we can get you the information. Well, just to put the, the district in perspective, they're in their second round um, of funding, and they have uh, been generally getting three to one leverage on their model. Uh, they put out 10 million initially, uh, that most recent round. I'm just looking for the numbers here, but uh, it was something less than 10 million. I think it was 7 million. The, the leveraging comes in, as was being asked, on a component of the overall subordinate financing into the acquisition, as the director was speaking to, the multiples that the uh, public money uh, together with the fund money as a subordinate component can see uh, multiples of four or five on top of that. 
Um, the number of units uh, will get that to you, uh, but the production has been uh, up and running uh, in less than a year uh, in the acquisitions, meaning the properties acquired. And the fundamental targeting uh, in the district and in the other jurisdictions is a public sector determined targeting. So different jurisdictions have used the approach to, to address different public policy objectives, including transit uh, alignment properties, uh, the idea that the, in the district focused a great deal on preserving existing affordable uh, restricted properties. So there are different ways to leverage the funds for different public purposes. Uh, it provides the public ourselves the ability to identify and prioritize uh, with our partners the acquisitions that meet our objectives, uh, particularly focused on our that, affordable. Yeah. That, that's obviously a, a, another potential another advantage in that it's not just whoever applies, but you can kind of guide them in that way. Right. Okay. That, that yep. makes sense. Yeah. If you could get the numbers, that would be helpful, but thank you. That was, that was helpful. Okay. Good questions. Um, yes. If, if you could please get us the details about those other models, I think yep. we really would need that. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I'll just to state it plainly. My question really is, uh, wouldn't it be best for us to add a hundred million dollars to the HIF to say that the Purple Line Corridor is an urgent priority and to just encourage projects to come in. But if it's true that this approach creates funding that really projects couldn't otherwise get, you know, that's that's a strong argument. But you know, I think we need to we need to kick the tires on that and see what see what organizations feel you know, the, their, their circumstances are. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the next meeting we're going to have is going to be talking about creating a, t taking cash, just as we've done with a segment of cash to create a construction fund that HOC will revolve, uh, just taking cash and creating a large HIF fund that could be spent down in a variety of ways, um, you know, targeting the purple line quarter, but it, not exclusive to that. And, um, you know, that is something that we have, we've done sometimes, you know, we've done incrementally, uh, but we haven't necessarily had that as an overarching game plan. Let's create a big fund, spend it down, set aside more cash, create a big fund, spend it down. Um, and that's an alternative, you know, so we, uh, I think we need to explore all these alternatives and see what we think makes the strongest case here. I mean, I would say in the end, uh, yes, we can create a hundred million dollar fund, but then you're adding your borrowing money, you're right. adding to counties, uh, debt capacity, debt service. Here we are leveraging one-time funds from the county to create private a fund with pri private money. So we are accomplishing with less counties resources over here. We're leveling the playing field. We're creating a product which can be easily used by our developers, whether they are nonprofit or a for-profit. We are setting the basic parameters, you know, for for this fund so that everyone knows how to you exercise, you know, the monies from this fund what the bank would the C or CDFI would be looking for in terms of uh, financial parameters, and we are leveling the, the playing field. And we, there's no debt service that's being paid from the state. There's a difference. There's a, there's, there's a difference. Um, and so, you know, that's just a, something we'll have to sort through. Um, but, uh, okay, so we'll get, we'll get more information from you on that. And um, we can return to that conversation, you know, possibly at the next uh, Fed meeting on, on housing finance, if not then the one after that. Um, and we'll hear from uh, the developers about it. Uh, you know, again, to your, to your comments there, um, one thing we just need to also understand is this, this is seeking to create an influx of projects using short-term funding, those projects also need long-term funding. And so if we, you know, we're not gonna get 10 projects coming into the door if those 10 projects don't also think that there's long-term funding available for them 
when they exit the short-term fund because uh, they won't, you know, no one's going to proceed without a long-term plan in place. Um, so that's just another piece we need to think through how this works is, you know, we can't, it's not, it's not possible for us to seed a whole bunch of new projects that we're only planning to support on the, in the short term. They won't come to us unless they think that they can also get support from us in the long term. And so what does that mean? What, what, how does this play out over time? It's just another key question. If you'd like to speak to that, you can. It's, it's something I think I would like to try to better understand as we as we proceed. Sure. Just just quickly, yes, our funds in HEF that limited, and to some extent, you know, uh, our funds will dictate how many projects that we are able to do. But at the same time, the fund allows the developer to act quickly, and then there are other financing that are available. In my prior life in Fairfax, I did do a project with no bond financing, no taxes, just with FHA financing and some funds from, from the county. So there are different ways to look at the, uh, the permanent financing structure. So all we are creating is simply a gateway for our developers to get to this financing tool in the, in the toolbox and be able to use it as they deem fit necessary for their own situation. Thank you, and thank you for being creative and, and trying to break new ground and be innovative here. That's right. Can I ask you a couple more, a couple more questions before we wrap up? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so two things. One, I appreciate that as well. I, I still am a little bit unclear, honestly, if, if the answer was, I mean, we have a finite amount of resources. We try to leverage them as best as we can and utilize them in a way that supports our priorities. It sounds to me to, to the point that was made earlier. Uh, if, if the answer is, we have been focusing too much on long-term financing and there's a gap in uh, short-term financing and that has left a number of projects unfulfilled that we would otherwise be able to you know, better meet our housing targets uh, and, and, and support more affordable housing. I could understand that. That hasn't been demonstrated and, 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 and I'm, a, I'm a bit unclear if, if, if that's the issue and I have not heard that from uh, from those who do affordable housing, that that's the biggest uh, issue. The only thing that I have always heard in, in this is that there always is a significant gap that needs to be filled, and there's a lack of clarity and transparency in how those decisions get made. I will make another uh, note for that for the HIP. I think that is the biggest issue that we face, that, uh, that folks don't know what is going to be available and when, when they are pursuing affordable housing deals, and that tends to upset the app card. At least that's the feedback that I have consistently gotten from those who know a lot more than I do and who are involved uh, in these deals. So I, I, I'd like you to speak to that. Is, is that what's missing here, or is that part of what's missing, that we think that we're missing out on short-term financing? And then number two, uh, you've raised a number of times that we're trying to level the playing field. And I'm just curious, who are the folks who are not currently able to access financing through the HIF that this would be expanding opportunities for? I'm all for that. I think all of us are all for that. I think the more folks that can participate in these types of transactions, the better off we're going to be, the more creativity we're going to have, the more... Uh, you know, uh, innovative approaches we're going to see. I mean, I think we're all for that. I just, uh, you know, I, I'm not clear uh, of who we're leveling the playing field to have, who, who are missing out on this. And then related to that, it seems to me that the way that our current system works, the private sector is vetting these projects initially, and then they're coming to us having already been vetted. And, and, you know, largely we know who is going to fund them, and then we decide as part of the capital stack whether or not, you know, we're going to participate based on certain, certain benchmarks that I think are less clear, accountable, and transparent than, than I would like. And I know you're working on, uh, on that. And, uh, um, what it seems here is that we would be vetting the projects that ultimately the CDFI would be because it is a fund that we're running. And that would just change the role that the county has traditionally had in HIF-funded affordable housing 
projects. And so if you could either here or in a future, you know, in writing, you know, respond to those three uh, questions and issues, I'd be very curious uh, to have a better understanding based on this proposal of how those three things would, 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 would work and play out. It might be the most brilliant answer, uh, but we can't hear you. Dr. Nagam, please uh, unmute yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know how I got muted. <laughs> Sometimes the, the host will regularly mute in case someone is going to the bathroom or something like that. Oh, I see. Okay. What I was going to say, uh, Councilman Peterson, was I hope I remember all your, all your questions. But to your first question, if you look at our uh, acquisition through the ROFA, there are only three or four that we have done in the prior, I don't know how many years, you know, in the recent memory. So there are a lot of times when the developer is looking at the preservation and they say, they may think, well, you know, I have to approach this financial institution, run the whole nine yards to get the financing, and then the opportunity goes because that property is in the marketplace only for a defined period of time. So this fund provides the opportunity for the developers to act quickly. Now, I think within that question, your question was, who are these developers? They may not be the ones whom we typically deal with, even if they have some financing resources available, but we are opening the doors for other prospective developers as well that here is a ready to go capital, which they can come and use. Uh, now, in terms of other part of the, your question, I think your second question, when we spoke to the developers, you're right, they said, well, some of them have the access to the capital markets. They can get their, you know, first lien. And as I mentioned in my presentation, your know, First lien is basically 80% loan to value. Then there is the delta. Where the delta will come from, this fund can provide that delta. So in, even if the project has the first lien holder identified for the other 20%, the fund comes into the play. And in terms of your, I think your other question, a lot of times we don't see all the fin financing commitments when the project comes to us. Yes, we issue the more often than not, actually recently, we have been issuing commitments once we see the financing commitment from other financing partners. But when the project simply in conceptual stage, the developer has not applied for bond financing of 9% credits, they want to come to us with an idea. They want to say, hey, this is something which we can support. So there's that factor as well in terms of permanent financing coming from here. So there are different things which come to the play before we get to the to the closing table. So we see the projects, you know, more often than not in the conceptual stage, and that permanent financing is two or three years away. Some of the projects that we are doing now, they basically conceptualize in 2016 or 17 timeframe. One of the projects was conceptualized in 2014, 15 timeframe, and you and I talked about one of the projects in your district, you know, pre-COVID. So it takes time for the developers to put the financing together. So, but they want to know from us if they work on this kind of project, is this something which we would support out of help? So sometimes they need, we are, we are not issuing a commitment, but they just want uh, some kind of a nod from us that this is something which we will support before they put you know, all their eggs in the in one basket go full steam in terms of, you know, the site plan approval process, applying for the credits, but it does take time and it does take money. So, so for certain projects, for preservation, for quick acquisition, this kind of fund will really help them. I think I have answered, probably I answered all your questions. I don't know if I missed anything. Andrew, you're, you're on. I think you're done or you're yeah i yeah I, I still have some questions as to really what the the gap is found I, mean, I understand with what you're saying in hypothetical terms but it just 
it's it's still not clear to me what the the, the the lack of gap funding and what that does from a tangible perspective in terms of either increasing the number of entities that can participate in affordable housing projects or the amount of affordable housing that we can uh, create or retain. I'm, I would love for that to be fleshed out a little bit more clearly in writing. You know, this came from one of your forums that you had with developers who, who expressed a concern about gap funding being inadequate and not causing problem X, Y, or Z, or, um, you know, other jurisdictions have this number and we have that number and that, you know, indicates a gap that we're missing because folks aren't even coming to us because they can't access the first part of the financing from the private markets before they even uh, come, come to us. I mean, I, I understand how you've described the way that our process works and the way that this process would work. It seems reasonable to me, but it's still not terribly clear what the existing problem is and how this necessarily would help to solve it. So I just, we get something in writing, something that's a little bit more clear. Uh, you know, I, I'm in no way opposed to this. In fact, I think that it has significant merit. Uh, it just is a little unclear to me, uh, you know, exactly where this would fit in into our overall housing affordability strategy and, uh, you know, where in the marketplace it would fit in in terms of, you know, what we're missing out on, how we would fill the gaps with this or part of the gap with this, and, um, you know, precisely, you know, how it would work in terms of the vetting of it and uh, the strategy of it. I think that would be, at least for me, very helpful. Sure, we, we can get you some, you know, information and we'll try to get, if we can, some examples from uh, one of these other firms which have been operating for some time to give you a snapshot of what kind of you know, projects have been done in other jurisdictions and what, what we can do in, in the county. Okay. All right, I think that's a good place for us to wrap up. Thank you very much to my colleagues. Thank you to everyone who participated. Linda, as always, you've done a Herculean job. Really appreciate everything that you bring to the council. Thank you so much. Um, we will reconvene at a future time. This was a very, very productive conversation. Uh, we've moved forward with a preliminary recommendation on the HOC fund, and we will get back into housing finance uh, in the next couple of weeks with a, our next committee meeting. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Jury in Montgomery County, Maryland, did indict him on five counts of capital murder. Uh, those warrants are still outstanding.